We're still waiting for a couple of more people to, uh, so we can have a quorum, and uh, we will begin immediately. Good. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Thanks uh, for the, uh, joining us in our second uh, day with regards uh, to our the 62nd uh, GF uh, Council meeting. Um, I want to welcome everybody. I, I hope that uh, everybody had a nice rest. And just uh, thanks. Uh, I personally want to thank everybody for the, the marathon session that uh, we had uh, yesterday. I hope that um, today and tomorrow is going to be less longer, probably same intense uh, in terms of content. Um, we won't begin our session of today, Wednesday, June 22nd, according to the agenda that was proposed uh, because we have a, a pending item from yesterday that um, has to do with the um, uh, Jeff A. The Integrate Programs uh, Lead Agency in Terms of Reference and, and Selection Process. Um, there was a proposal um, to um, have a conversation uh, on the, the decision on this agenda item. And um, yesterday night, night uh, there were some conversations. And um, very late night, we we all came with a agreed text uh, of convergence and consensus. I'll uh, pass it over to my colleague, Gustavo Fonseca, who will be explaining the proposed, uh, the, the, the conversations, the adjustments to the text, as well as the proposed uh, decision for council, so we can explore the possibilities for a decision from council on this um, particular uh, topic uh, with regards to the lead agency terms of reference and selection process. Gustavo, you got the floor. Thank you very much, Carlos Manuel, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as Carlos Manuel mentioned uh, last night, a subgroup of council members who were interested in this uh, agenda met uh, uh, here to come up with uh, a suggested text that was circulated to every one of you uh, later on uh, last night. In essence, there, I'm just going to highlight, since I don't need to repeat it because you have the written text before you, uh, the first is uh, changes in the recommended uh, council decision on document uh, Jeff slash C62 slash 05, the integrated programs uh, lead agency ref the terms of reference and selection process. Uh, the decision, uh, uh, the recommended decision, council decision includes uh, details <coughs> on, um, on the next uh, <coughs> council meeting uh, and uh, details about the report that the council would like to see uh, in regards to um, agency selection and in particular how the final configuration meets uh, the, the aspirational targets on uh, agency share in JEF 8. So that's on the decision text. Then on, uh, on part one and paragraph four, uh, there, is, uh, there is the discussion on the aspirational target that uh, was included in, in the replenishment document, uh, particularly in regards to uh, regional multilateral development banks and IFAD uh, with an aspirational target of 10 percent. Uh, and then moving down uh, on on the, uh, section two, criteria for lead agency selection. Um, we have uh, on point paragraph number six, an addition that uh, um, asks for the, con the process to consider uh, past performance of uh, existing IPs uh, and, uh, and how they could, uh, they could continue to play a role uh, if performance was uh, was already uh, well recognized, so to avoid discontinu discontinuity in existing uh, integrated programs. Then going down to point 
Section 3, lead agency selection uh, process. Uh, uh, an addition uh, was uh, done to that paragraph, now paragraph 12, that uh, asks the Secretariat, the Jeff Secretariat, to reach out to OFPs to collect views regarding the experience on implementation and institutional arrangements with the past IPs and impact programs, as well as uh, experience on collaboration with lead agencies. Moving forward, paragraph 14, uh, agencies are, are being encouraged uh, to engage with uh, other agencies in, uh, in consultations, in particular regarding co-leadership arrangements. Paragraph 15 makes it explicit that uh, staff will be part of this process, including at least one member in the selection committee, and that's on paragraph 15. And then there are some changes, uh, not changes, but additions to uh, the template in terms of criteria for, for involvement, and, uh, and also uh, additions in the um, in regards to uh, experience of certain agencies with, uh, with um, uh, focus on innovation and, uh, and uh, collaboration with academia. Then if you go to NX3, the, Jeff, the generic template, uh, two, three items were added to that, and uh, they're self-explanatory. You can see them in the rewrite. We uh, considered the these uh, suggestions and uh, and we, in our estimation, let's say from the Jeff pers uh, Secretary perspective, and based on the experience we've had so far, that uh, these changes uh, are, are indeed uh, uh, useful and uh, they can help to further operationalize the lead agency selection process. So, uh, Carlos Manuel, the floor is uh, open to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thanks uh, to you, Gustavo, and uh, I want to thank uh, council members and uh, staff that uh, supported this uh, this process. Uh, the text that um, was explained by Gustavo was shared tonight or very early this morning. So I presume all the council members uh, has in, in their inbox this text. Uh, so I would like to open the floor to see if there are any comments, questions, uh, observations uh, from council members. Um, Switzerland, please. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, and thanks to everyone in the drafting group. We actually just now cleared an additional small few amendments. Uh, so can I introduce those uh, for council members? It's very, very, okay. yes. So in, the dis um, in paragraph now six, it would um, have a full stop after selection process, full stop, and then it would read, the lead agency should aim um, for continuity of child projects on the various IPs. Should aim for continuity of child projects on the various IPs of different chef cycles with the same thematic focus. So it's, we, we disentangle the two concepts and because one is backward looking and the other one is forward looking and we make two sentences out of it and we formulate it in a positive manner and not in a negative one. Um, and then there was an additional amendment to the decision text so it would read a bit better. Um, and it would say, on the process instead of for at the 63rd meeting of the council. In comma, including full transparency about the proposals received, comma, and consideration of the potential impacts of lead agency. It's just better, better English. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> Good to have native speakers. Um, and then there is a late night drafting error in the Annex 3, in the additional question around civil society, um, and it should uh, read a clear, so does the agency provide a clear explanation on the involvement of women, youth, civil society, indigenous peoples, and local communities? Because rightly so, uh, Karen pointed out, 50% of the population are women, so they're not, it's not like civil society including, so that's just a, a late night drafting error. 
doesn't really change the, the meaning of the question. Thank you, that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriela. Any other council members would like to address the floor? Yes, uh, France, uh, Clement. Merci, Monsieur le Co-président. Je vais m'exprimer en français. Nous remercions le secrétariat euh, et Gabriela pour ces nouvelles modifications dans le document euh, qui prend en compte nos commentaires. Sur le processus, nous considérons qu'il aurait été préférable que le secrétariat, suite aux commentaires formulés en séance par les membres du Conseil, présente une nouvelle version révisée plus que, plutôt que les propositions de modification soient préparées, voire négociées en petits groupes. Cela ne nous semble pas entièrement transparent et inclusif, en particulier pour les membres à distance. Et nous espérons que cette remarque soit effectivement prise en compte à l'avenir. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, Clement. Uh, we got uh, China. Tianwei, please. Thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Gabriela for the, the, the drafting yesterday, and we can uh, go with that uh, revision. And, and my authority would like to, to add one more sentence, it's just a minor point uh, um, in Annex 1, after the paragraph 1. Uh, it's actually a one sentence to uh, indicate that the lead agency should comply with the national law and regulations of the recipient countries. So I know this is uh, obvious, but uh, we just would like to make it clear in the annex that just to add this minor point. Do you need me to repeat? Yeah. It's uh, in annex one after the paragraph one, a simple sentence read as, the lead agency should comply with the national laws and regulations of the receiving countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, China. I don't see anybody else um, asking for the floor. Gustavo, um, yes, um, we got uh, Angola. Oh, over to you, Julio. Thank, thank you, Carlos. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Julio, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Southern Africa constituency. Um, my co the contribution that I would like to know, or the comment, is that we had a recipient country uh, meeting, council meet members for recipient countries, and one of the issues that I have raised was that the leading agencies should also, uh, we should consider that the ag leading agencies should have uh, offices at, in the country where, uh, the pro where they will be uh, working with, with the projects because it uh, will help the communication straight not only with the implementing agency, but with also uh, people from the government. Because we have been facing some difficulties sometimes when we choose uh, an implementing agency that does not have the offices in our country. Uh, there are many things sometimes that misses because of lack of communications. And if the lead agency should have the offices in most of the countries where they will be accompanying or helping to uh, prepare and executing projects, it will be good, especially for uh, a focal points at the country level to develop the, 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 the projects, to accompany straight together with the implementing agency. The second uh, issue that I have raised was that the, we were a bit confused and we were asking if the lead agency will also be, uh, can also play the role of an implementing 
agency. And the answer that we obtained was that it depends on the OFPs or at the government to decide rather we want the lead agency to also play the role of an implementing agency. But there will be uh, an extra, uh, how can I say, incentive. And this is the question that I, uh, I would like to raise if, 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 if I may do that. That we know that the implementing agency, we, we have uh, uh, agency fee, what we call the agency fee for the implementing agency. And we would like to know what about the leading agency? What will be the percentage uh, that uh, the leading agency will be having as a fee to give uh, countries the support of preparing and, uh, and, implement, and implementing also the, the, the project? Uh, but those are the, the two, the two, the two uh, issues or comments that I would like to, to, to raise. Thank you. Um, obrigado. Muchas gracias, Julio. So, um, having heard um, the different interventions uh, from, from the floor, uh, some of them making pro uh, specific uh, amendments to the text that, uh, that uh, was worked tonight, uh, I would like to pass it over to, uh, to Gustavo to hear uh, from him uh, the reactions on the proposed text and the questions that were presented uh, or observations that uh, were done by Julio. Over to you, Gustavo. Okay, thank you. Um, let me go through uh, the comments and uh, from France. Yeah, we will revise the, the document uh, once we have the final agreement, hopefully in this session, and circulate it to all of you as a revised, as a rev document containing uh, your uh, agreement that uh, you know, we have discussed here. On the point raised by China on adding uh, national laws, I think this is a, a matter that uh, is, uh, is uh, better addressed between the agencies and the respective governments and it doesn't uh, restrict itself to lead agencies uh, uh, in this process. So it's, uh, it's probably not a... Um, a viable uh, addition to this because it uh, gets immersed also on issues related to uh, safeguards and uh, other additional um, requirements that are in the JAF uh, policy uh, space. So uh, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it would be uh, uh, innocuous uh, to add that and might create uh, other issues. Uh, Julio, uh, Julio, você you mentioned uh, two, two items. One, uh, a suggestion on the agencies uh, having offices in the countries. Uh, th these these uh, considerations, uh, when the OFPs uh, choose agencies, uh, they might be one aspect that you have to consider, but it, it should not be a restriction for any agency to apply for a lead agency uh, uh, role because you know, by definition, they will have to lead uh, a regional or a global program uh, that uh, serves uh, all countries that are involved, that will be involved in the implementation through child projects. So uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, request, it's not operationalizable at, uh, at the lead agency level, but you, of course you are free to, uh, in, in the case of uh, of Angola in the case of any recipient country to take into consideration if uh, having an office in the country is something that uh, the country would like to prioritize in its, uh, in its uh, child project selection process uh, once we have a lead agency. Um, and uh, on the question of fees, um, the thing that uh, sometimes doesn't, doesn't get across very clearly is that a programmatic approach uh, is nothing but a collection of individual projects. The lead agency is responsible for implementing one of these projects, uh, a regional or a global component, just like implementing agencies will be responsible as chosen by the participating countries to implement activities at the national level 
that are part of the overall programmatic uh, uh, framework. The fees in our uh, project cycle policy apply to the individual projects. So the lead agency will have accrued the fees that are uh, assigned uh, by policy uh, to uh, the implementation of a particular project. The same goes for agencies that will implement national projects. So in other words, there's no compounding of fees uh, one on top of the other. Actually, the fees are paid for the services that the agency provides, and the lead agency will provide the services of running the global or the regional project component of a programmatic approach. So hopefully that clarifies. Carlos Manuel, over to you. Oh, thank, you thank you so much, uh, Gustavo, and I hope that um, everybody feels uh, satisfied uh, with uh, Gustavo's explanations and uh, comments. I would like to try to see if um, we, we may be able to, um, to bring this to the decision of the Council, the proposed text. Council members are willing to see this? Yes. Okay, so having finished the, the discussion on this agenda item, which is agenda item 05, um, Jeff 8, integrated program, lead agency, uh, terms of reference and selection process, um, I would like to invite the, the Council to adopt the DAP draft decision included in document uh, GFC 62 uh, slash 05. No. Uh, so the decision would be to, to approve the, the changes in the current document, and we will circulate the final uh, product uh, when the, before the summary of the co-chairs, so that there will be the ability to scrutinize uh, the changes that were orally uh, described here and, uh, I guess, approved here. And, uh, and with that, we can move forward, perhaps. Okay, so we need to bring it once more for a formal decision or is implicit the decision based on what you indicated? Now, we will circulate the revised document uh, okay. to all, all members according to the, to the decision that was taken here on the respective changes. And, uh, and this document will then be, uh, we will have the summary of the co-chairs if there's anything that remains okay. when this item okay. comes for uh, review. Uh, during the last council uh, session, then uh, you know they can bring up, but hopefully there won't be any queries. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks uh, for the clarification, Gustavo, and I, I think that's uh, the decision that we will take. Thanks everybody for the, the great work uh, in generating convergence on, on this point. So let me, having having had uh, this decision, let me bring uh, you all. The, um, to today's agenda, I would like to, uh, to begin by, by welcoming and saying hello to my co-chair, Ambassador Fituri, good morning. Also, I would like to send my regards to, to our council member, the Ludovica uh, Soberini. She's uh, unfortunately not uh, uh, joining us over here, so my, my regards uh, to her. Um, today's uh, first agenda item is the report uh, of the chairperson of the scientific and technical advisory panel, uh, STAP. I would um, ask uh, my co-chair uh, to uh, chair this agenda item uh, so he can invite uh, Dr. Rosina Bierbaum. Over to you, Ambassador Fituri. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, colleagues and friends. Uh, we're now on agenda item eight, and I uh, would like to invite uh, Dr. Rosina Bierbaum to introduce document Jeff slash step slash C62 slash info 01, which is the report of step. Rosina, you have the floor. Good morning. Thank you very much, co-chair. Um, as is usual, I will begin and end with a wonder of nature. Some things don't change. So this is a photo from Damara Land in Namibia. And although the photographer was intending to find desert elephants at sunset, he instead encountered this huge group of teenage ostriches, over 100 of them, under the care of one adult male. 
and ostriches organize their broods into kind of kindergartens, um, but rarely in such a large uh, Jeff-sized group. <laughs> And it is wonderful to see this sighting, and it is also wonderful to see the Jeff partnership all together again. So I think this herd of ostriches all heading in the same direction under a leader is a wonderful wonder of nature. Um, but I do want to say any analogy to the father ostrich as our CEO shepherding us all towards a very successful Jeff 8 is purely coincidental. <laughs> On a somber note, we lost another wonder of nature on Christmas Day, our own Tom Lovejoy. He passed away surrounded by his three daughters, thousands of books, and a roaring fire in his beloved 300-year-old log cabin, very close to where we are. And he served as the previous staff chair and remained my senior advisor throughout. Um, the world will sorely miss him. We all associate Tom Lovejoy with the term biological diversity and for his many efforts to understand, conserve, and teach us all about biodiversity. He actually worked 50 years in the Amazon at the same field site, a wonderful one, Camp 51. On STAP, I am delighted that Dr. Miriam Diamond has joined us as the new chemicals and waste person, and she is online, and the council just approved her a few days ago. And she is a professor in the School of Environment and in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Toronto. She studies chemical contaminants, uh, human and ecological exposure, and then translates these findings into preventative measures and policy advice. So Dr. Diamond will continue STAP's breadth and depth in social, ecological, and chemical science. Um, she has extensive experience, including working in uh, Uganda and uh, in Bangladesh and will be a major asset to the Jeff family. You'll all meet her in December. But I also want to take this opportunity to say goodbye to Blake Ratner, from, who did international waters for us, and Dr. Salim Ali, who was uh, climate change mitigation. Their terms will be up at the end of this year, and we'll be recruiting their successors very soon. So we hope the Jeff family will help circulate those terms of reference and those positions. Uh, and they will be here to say goodbye to us, and we hope you will also meet new ones at the December Council. And all the staff members are either here in person or online, so the brain trust is present. Um, here's my presentation order. As usual, I will start with the science. Um, lots of new science. There's always new science to talk about. Um, and I would just say all of the things that are coming out seem to support the amazing, ambitious Jeff A agenda we have to achieve um, a healthy, productive, and a resilient environment for human well-being. So this is a graphic, a very busy graphic, from Stockholm Plus 50, which just occurred and only covers things that happened over the last 50 years. But in the beginning, in 1972, the Stockholm Declaration already recognized the links between development and poverty and environment. And at that point, Indira Gandhi said, it is clear that the environmental crisis which is confronting the world will profoundly alter the future destiny of our planet. And UNEP was launched that year, and that was uh, followed by a flood of groundbreaking science and international cooperation. I would say it was almost a delicate dance between scientific understanding and evolving diplomacy as we learned more about our human impacts on Mother Earth. And then in 87, we had the Montreal Protocol. In 90, the first climate report. In 2000, we declared that the Earth had entered a new epoch, a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, dominated by humans. In 2005, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which the Jeff supported. In 2009, the concept of planetary boundaries, demarcating, if you will, a safe operating space for humanity. In 2019, IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and then all the way on the right in 2022, that we have now transgressed six 
planetary boundaries. And I don't think you can actually see very well, but there are tiny red numbers going across the timeline. The concentration of CO2 on the left was 327 parts, and it is now 421 parts per million. Um, as we all agree here in the Jeff family, we really need to redefine our relationship with nature from one of extraction and exploitation to one of care. A healthy planet for the prosperity of all is our responsibility and our opportunity as the Stockholm Plus 50 declared. Just to show you these planetary boundaries in a bit more detail, in 2009, we already knew we had transgressed three, that being climate change, biodiversity, and biogeochemical, the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. But by 2022, this year, as I told you, we've added transgressing land use change, novel entities, which includes toxics and plastics, and just in April, a new one identified by the Stockholm Resilience Center that they're calling green water. And that is the water that's available to plants. Until now, we thought of the water boundary as within the safe zone, but that was because we were thinking of the water boundary as extraction of water in rivers and in lakes and in groundwater, which is blue water. Um, but green water, soil moisture, is absolutely necessary to ensure the resilience of the biosphere, to secure our land carbon sinks, and to regulate atmospheric circulation. Just one example you're all familiar with, the Amazon is drying out, and the forest is losing soil moisture as a result of climate change and deforestation, pushing it closer to a tipping point. This year, the World Economic Forum 2022 Global Risk Report listed five of the top 10 potentially most damaging global risks in green as environmental. Climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, environmental damage, and natural resource loss. And the three that you see in red are very interrelated. Those are societal risks, and the erosion of social cohesion, livelihood crises, and infectious diseases. All of these interlinked as we are trying to think about them at the Jeff. So let me turn to some of this climate science. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released two reports since we last met. And their working group, too, focused on impacts, vulnerability, adaptation, and noted, as we know, that human that climate change is already causing very widespread and um, dangerous disruption in both nature and in human livelihoods for billions of people. And they really made a point this time that said, we need to get on with adaptation aggressively. Incremental adaptation may not be enough given the pace <clears throat> and magnitude of climate change they also noted that the science of attribution has advanced to where we can identify the climate signal in many of these extreme events that we're seeing increasing globally. And the report explicitly noted, I think for the first time, that nature-based solutions are really important both to reduce the impacts of climate change and to enhance adaptation. And so it urges much more attention, both near-term and long-term, to nature-based solutions. And then working group three came out. That focuses on mitigation. They noted that the last decade has had the highest annual average global greenhouse gases in human history. They also noted that limiting temperatures to 1.5 degrees C, our aspirational goal, would require greenhouse gases to peak by 2025. But in good news, the cost of green energy technologies are drastically redu reducing and dropping, and there's a, a real increase in laws and policies <clears throat> and market instruments that are tackling emissions in many sectors and countries. And this report, too, noted the important linkage between mitigation of climate change, adaptation to climate change, and sustainable development. And I think, as the Jeff has already noted, it is really interesting that both of these reports are calling for transformational change. 
the World Meteorological Organization put out its State of the Global Climate 2021 and confirmed the last seven years were the warmest on record and that four key climate change indicators set new records, which is not good in this case. A record of greenhouse gas concentrations, of sea level rise, of ocean heat content, and ocean acidification. And very recently, scientists from Australia showed that diatoms, or phytoplanktons, the base of the food chain, which is really responsible for 40% of the ocean primary production and, and a major driver of biological carbon dioxide sequestration, might decline from ocean acidification. And this is an example where as we, we learn more about how systems operate, it can lead to unexpected outcomes. In this case, a worrisome one, because we thought diatoms would be resilient to ocean acidification. They're silicon-based, they're not calcium carbonate-based, but we're learning more about how the changing ratio of nutrients to support the base of this food chain um, are changing, in particular nitrogen and, and silica. And if you don't know what a diatom looks like, here's some pictures of them. They're just beautiful, they're tiny, they're algae in glass houses, if you will. Um, but, and it takes about 30 of those to be the width of a human hair, but their decline could even be more negative on the ocean's ability to regulate global warming and actually exacerbate it. So the devil in new details we're finding. Another set of new studies continue to highlight how climate change is impacting important ecosystems. So on the left, a study in May showed that changing climate could lead to a massive reduction in the broad expanses of tundra in Siberia and in North America, and a steady advance of tree species into that area. But the loss of the tundra, of course, will release enormous quantities, potentially, of CO2, carbon dioxide, and of methane. In the middle picture, another, st oops, an another study in, oh, now I can't go back. Yes, I can. Um, another study in the middle picture here highlights how climate change is affecting the tropical forests in Australia, the rainforest, and the types of trees across many different forest types in this region are dying at double the rate they were dying in the previous four decades. Um, and that appears to be completely due to climate impacts, and that is reducing carbon storage, and that is making it harder to reach our climate goals. And on the right, also related to Australia, another study indicates that climate is slowing down the movement of the ocean current conveyor belt, <laughs> another tipping point that we truly want to avoid. Um, that could shift the Earth's climate to a more La Nina state, and that would mean more flooding in eastern Australia and worse droughts and amplified fire seasons in the southwest US, for example. This next one looks a little complicated, but let me just say, it has been hard to find studies that look at both biodiversity and climate change, but they can be a win-win. And this is one study that shows it. So the image on the slide is showing you where case studies have been conducted uh, that looked at the 21 action-based targets of the post-2020 CBD framework and they evaluated those for also concurring climate mitigation outcomes. So then the fans that you see under them indicate if there are synergies in green between biodiversity and climate, or if there are trade-offs in yellow. The good news in this global picture, of course, is that most of the fans are very green. And just to show you a couple of really positive ones, here, look at two regions very closely where there's very high congruence between biodiversity targets and climate mitigation. You can see in the Amazon and in the African peatlands, there's green in all parts of the fan. And the composite indicators are showing that actions that are win-win for biodiversity can also be win-win for climate simultaneously. So we really do need to continue to try to pursue these. New reports coming out on microplastics. They're everywhere in our ecosystem. And a new study of 19 different sites in Antarctica showed for the first time that newly fallen snow contains a significant amount of tiny plastic fragments. 
uh, PET, which is polyethylene terephthalate used in clothing and drinking bottles, was found in 80% of the plastic types. Now, I doubt the Antarctic explorers are throwing away their bottles down there. They, this plastic got to Antarctica through long-range transportation, either on wind or on ocean currents. And another study using very sophisticated laser technology in the tropical Indian Ocean found unexpectedly high concentrations of plastics in the open ocean. And it looks like those particles are actually related to abrasion from ships and also uh, the same PET plastic. I, I think this highlights the incredible importance of Jeff's investment in targeting the plastics and textile sectors and the integrated program on the circular plastic economy. And in other good news, I just want to say there is really a burgeoning literature and, and interest in the private sector and the investment community wanting to make nature an investable asset and recognizing that nature services are absolutely essential to business continuity and to business success. And this is just one on biodiversity, financial risk, and system stability. And the report notes, quote, we have learned that climate change and biodiversity are inextricably linked, creating the potential for risks to compound and create systemic dislocations. An integrated approach to these twin threats is essential. So in good news, the private sector is becoming motivated. Let me move on now to our reports and recent work. Um, over the last six months, we've, staff has reviewed the scientific and practitioner literature on topics that we hope will be helpful in supporting the Jeff's ambitions for Jeff 8 and for good project design. So our work has produced nine papers, <laughs> some of which built on previous work, for example, transformation and knowledge management, and on others we're just starting to explore and are anxious to hear your thoughts on policy coherence and innovation. So I'm calling transformation, risk, and innovation a, a trio here. You know, I, I'm going to repeat some words back to you that you know our vision for Jeff 8 is the achievement of a healthy, a productive, and a resilient environment underpinning the well-being of human societies. And so Jeff 8 seeks to transform global systems, including food, urban, energy, nature, health, and transformational change will often require innovation, which can entail risks. So we are thinking at STAP that this trio of transformation, risk, and innovation will be particularly important to think about as we operationalize the 11 new integrated programs. And, and I think these should be thought about together to be sure we are making uh, pleasing music <laughs> like the talented musicians on the right and not discordant music by having uh, modes of action in these three areas that are not coherent. There was a lot of talk yesterday about risk appetite, so let me pull this one out. It, it, it's, it's very familiar, and, it, and the Jeff is adept with managing risk. I mean, many Jeff projects are in fragile and conflict areas, but here I'm, I'm talking about a different kind of risk, where higher risks might be deliberately sought in exchange for higher rewards, and that is GEBs or global environmental benefits. And so our risk appetite paper responds to the Jeff Sex request following the IEO OPS7 recommendations to offer advice on, quote, a clear baseline for risk acceptance in the Jeff A programming. There is actually a, a broad literature on defining a risk appetite to organizations like banks and agencies. And formal risk appetite strategies have been adopted widely by the boards of financial institutions. And the evidence indicates that the practice of establishing firm-wide risk appetite has a profound effect on their activities, and it results in improved monitoring and decision making. So our paper, as a thought piece for you, focuses on why it would be useful to do this in the Jeff context and some thoughts on how to approach doing it. So there's a few points here. If, as in the picture, you're going to hang off a cliff like this character is, it might be a good idea to have thought about how much risk you're willing to take before you do it. 
and explain why you're doing it to your family and friends and help people understand why you might drive very carefully to avoid a speeding fine, but you might be willing to do this uh, rock climbing for the buzz it gives you. When we think about the, the Jeff and the council, I presume you are likely to have a very low tolerance for risk in areas like financial fraud or corruption. But this shouldn't stop you from being deliberately prepared to embrace risk when it comes to innovation. And as we know, if you want to create opportunities to get big returns, for example, leveraging huge amounts of private sector finance, then we have to take some risk in setting up new financial instruments to get that investment involved in funding a huge expansion in environmentally friendly practices. So it becomes important to articulate a clear picture of how you, as the council, may be willing to accept much higher risks in some areas than in others. And again, I think this is going to be particularly important in the integrated programs where we really want to drive transformational change. So the staff paper reviews some fairly well-known and well-traveled ways of developing a risk appetite statement or strategy. And we urge the council with the secretariat to put some work into this to support the, the transformational rhetoric that we all believe. And then once you have defined areas in which you're willing to push for more risk, you can start to think about how to minimize that risk. So for example, the non-grant instrument projects um, may be exploring new financial models, um, but you might want to put in place more intense monitoring and learning so that things that aren't working can be identified quickly and future activities adjusted to suit so you minimize downside risk caused by embracing innovation. And similarly, once you've identified the risky areas, you can choose maybe more relevant metrics of success. So for example, for an IP portfolio, maybe you could consider the total GEBs achieved across the program rather than just the percent of projects that fail or succeed. So just some thoughts here. Our, our primary recommendation continues to be that the council and the GEFSEC needs to work on creating a proper risk appetite strategy before everything is completely underway. I don't think it's a massive task, and it could be the work of a subcommittee of council working with some options provided by the secretariat to have a plan for approval even by the next council meeting. If, I, if we don't have a coherent strategy on risk, you know, you, you then might try to minimize risk everywhere, and if you do, you probably risk minimizing uh, GEB returns. So I hope this will be a, a useful think piece um, for the council and for Jeff Sack. On innovation, also part of our, our trio, um, staff had a 2019 report on innovation where we said it's an idea embodied in a technology or a process that creates new value and it must also be scalable. And in that report, we talked about five innovative domains, um, and those are technology, business models, institutional and social, policy, and financing. And so we're starting to think more about innovation and that connection to risk and transformation across the Jeff portfolio, and welcome your thoughts. So for example, the role of innovation in the IPs, this new dedicated window on innovation, how medium-sized projects have indeed been innovative and maybe could do more in composite to test kinds of innovation and to further innovation. And then on what issues would it be most useful for you to have information on innovation? So we welcome your thoughts on what staff should do further as you think about innovation, risk, and transformation, and again, arguing we think they're all related. On transformation, this figure is going to be hard to read, um, but we are clearly in Jeff 8 seeking transformational impacts using um, our funding in a catalytic way. And so that could be a pilot project, which may or may not itself be particularly innovative, but then maybe it can be scaled up to be transformational. And there, there are many pathways that you can get to scaling. You can scale out, which is to do more of the same, to impact greater numbers. You can scale up, which might be changing the rules or the institutions to enable 
um, transformation. And then what the literature calls scaling deep, which is changing norms or changing culture so that there is support for transformation writ large. And, and often more than one of those will be required. Um, last year, staff's paper on transformation defined one that leads to enduring change at a sufficient scale to deliver what we're calling a, you know, a step change or a step improvement in one or more of the GEBs. And, and we also said you, know, you really should ask if an investment is intended to be transformational, and if so, um, is the goal sufficiently transformational, and is the logic there for achieving that transformation? And we've tried to use, from Jeff's theory of change, a suggestion on some metrics where you might be able to monitor and learn about transformation. Um, so four come from Jeff Eight's theory of change, governance and policies, that is, whether the expected changes in governance and policies are actually happening, um, multi-stakeholder engagement, are multi-stakeholder dialogues being maintained or increased? Innovation and learning, is it emerging and are learning and knowledge exchange happening? And then financial leverage, are financial resources being leveraged and increasing? So those first four are from the Jeff theory of change and they also are quite congruent with um, the, the STAPS enabling elements which I talked to you about at the, at the last two councils. Um, so I think we want to add maybe one fifth one that we got from reading some of the literature from GIZ, which is, um, is uh, whether organizations and other actors have the capacity for required change. So here's just some thoughts on how we might evaluate transformational change, and I hope that that might serve as useful food for thought. And, um, and Jeff Sack may or may not be interested in pursuing a workshop with STAP on things that like transformational metrics. We talked about that a few months ago, so it is something that, that we could think about more going forward and conceivably uh, even before December Council. We also did um, a paper on co-benefits, and again, this is just kind of a think piece because the Jeff policy recommendations asked Jeff Sec to develop options to be discussed a year from this coming December, and the quote is, to improve the capture of human and socioeconomic well-being metrics in the results monitoring and improve their consideration in the design of Jeff funded projects and programs to support the achievement of global environmental benefits. And so, as I said, um, we did this little think piece where we would distinguish between two kinds of co-benefits that the Jeff might want to consider capturing. The first, which we're calling necessary or prerequisite, and then the other, which we're calling secondary or incidental. So, some co-benefits, for example, local stakeholder improved livelihoods, are probably necessary for durable global environmental benefits, and we would call them, therefore, integral to project design, so these are prerequisite or necessary, not simply incidental. But there may be other benefits, including environmental and socioeconomic benefits outside of the Jeff's mandate, or that may not actually be critical to achieving the GEB, but they can demonstrate Jeff's additional value and include its contribution to more broadly improving um, human well-being and impacts on the economy, for example. So, so you can imagine there could be human health benefits from, for example, reduced land clearing and reduced spread of zoonoses, you know, an interesting connection, but not something that would automatically be called a necessary benefit, but a very interesting co-benefit. And so as the Jeff each strategy is ultimately implemented, we suggest adding metrics for at least the necessary co-benefits to the results measurement framework scorecard, and then that'll help track how the partnership is achieving the design and management of projects and programs for transformational outcomes. We did another think piece uh, the choice of this title on simple future narratives is deliberate because it is incontrovertible that there is more than one plausible future. Um, no less an authority than the Jeff A. Strategic Positioning Framework noted the importance of designing projects, quote, 
for resilience in the face of multiple plausible future scenarios, unquote. And, and Stapp wants to be really clear that complex or highly quantified approaches are not needed to improve the design of Jeff projects, but GEBs need to be durable and they need to take into account not just future climate risk, but other climate, other risk, other drivers of change, including population, conflict, migration. If we don't do so, the outcomes might be short-lived or less resilient. Uh, or conceivably even damaging uh, to the environment and to people. So developing simple future narratives at an early stage in a project can widen the range of options, particularly those that will be robust to future uncertainty. And I do want to say that considering plausible futures is becoming the best practice in sustainability and development projects, including among several of our JAF agencies and other external organizations. So I do think we need to keep up. And we are happy to offer further advice on how to develop simple future narratives for projects and programs. Knowledge management. We've offered a short paper for this council with a theory of change to drive development of the new JAF 8 uh, strategy, and you can see we suggest there's five key elements. Exercise strong governance and leadership so that we have systemic KM and L culture, that we facilitate durable learning through a redesigned approach that records and uses knowledge, that we promote both empowerment and exchange and ensure that that knowledge can be easily shared that we adopt the ability to mine the knowledge so that we can apply knowledge in new investments from previous work. And fifth, to encourage tracking and adapting to position the Jeff really as a thought leader in knowledge management. It's obvious that knowledge management and learning is essential to identify, replicate, and scale up best practices and solutions and to improve the overall performance and impact of investments. So we all know we need a system uh, that helps developers access what works, where, why, how, under what circumstances, as well as what doesn't work. And uh, although the CEO has just left, one of his favorite examples would be, <laughs> now you may leave, <laughs> you know the example. <laughs> I was going to say, if you want to know different ways to eradicate a, a problem in a wet forest, where would you look? And, and the CEO has told some wonderful examples about, quote, a technically failed Jeff project in the Galapagos that actually has informed actions many other places. Um, but, but the point was to really, where would you look across the Jeff portfolio? You don't want to look project by project. You don't want to look website by website. And so a well-organized system would deliver the answers in a few seconds. And there are databases that exist like this, WOCAT for land degradation, conservation measures, partnership, and the Jeff could do this too. Now, I think we have a huge opportunity as we think about the 11 integrated programs which will all have knowledge platforms. So some questions I think we should think about. How will they be organized? By type of intervention? Will there be a common format? Will the platforms across IPs be linked? Will the platforms be accessible to those outside the program? So again, we want to support rapid learning and application and ensuring that innovation and learning are systematized and durable. And again, we would offer to host a workshop with the Jeff agencies, which have a lot of experience in knowledge management, and the Jeff Secretariat, um, if that were deemed important and appropriate. Um, policy coherence, a very important topic. A better alignment between the economic, the social, and the environmental policies will enable more ambitious levels of the GEBs to achieve, be achieved more quickly and at lower cost. As we all know, misaligned policies, and, and Carlos Manuel has spoken to this quite eloquently, can allow leakage, can reduce the durability of GEBs, or can even result in investments that can be environmentally damaging. So we think that Jeff should think about policy coherence in several ways. One, working across sectors. Two, working across different levels of government. And three, across different timescales. 
We think um, it was important to articulate explicitly policy coherence in the Jeff context and to consider how to coordinate its influence in these areas. So Jeff could operationalize policy coherence at its different operational levels, you know, some with our, which are within its narrower sphere of control, like projects, of course, and programs, and in particular, again, the IPs, or the new pool of funds for policy coherence, um, then up to working with countries, and then working to the wider sphere of the multilateral environmental agreements. So this paper on policy coherence details some of the actions, some of the tools, some already are being used by Jeff agencies. For example, a UNEP, UNDP, ADB, and the World Bank, and that could possibly help deliver greater policy coherence. Now, if you watch the picture, we do not want the situation we see on the right <laughs> with, with this pair of Mali fowl, hard at work on their nesting mounds, but not working cooperatively in a common direction. They're native to um, Australasia and South Africa, and they actually have an unusual mode of incubating their, their eggs, much like alligators do, in a massive pile of rotting compost. But you have to keep the temperature right. So you either remove or add more material, but clearly these two were not working together. And so we hope that policy coherence will help the Jeff family to achieve a common goal and reap the full benefits of all this hard work in our projects and programs. Um, we've also done a short think piece on the blue economy. There is a burgeoning literature in this area. And in Jeff 8, as you know, there will be four IPs um, that support the blue economy, the land-based sources of marine pollution, policy coherence in the small island states, reduction of plastic pollution uh, in marine environments, and then the food systems includes, of course, sustainable, sustainable intensification of aquaculture. There are also three focal areas that include blue economy as well. So we actually said as we think more forward about blue economy for JAF 8 and into JAF 9, future priorities might be pursued through the four transformational lever levers that JAF 8's theory of change already lists. And those, as you may have memorized, include governance and policies, financial leverage, innovation and learning, and multi-stakeholder dialogue. And in this paper, we also suggest some areas that Jeff might consider for investment that are you know, consistent with the mandate and on our targeted systems transformation. So for example, circular economy approaches to, the, to stop land-based sources of marine pollution. There's many opportunities where the Jeff could help support biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions, including even things like ocean accounting, so that it reflects the true value of oceans, and so more natural capital. And de-risking finance and using innovation to mobilize investment, for example, in sustainable fisheries or mariculture or ecotourism. Um, and we also have a short paper on a decision tree for adaptation, and I discussed earlier how the working group two of the IPCC says, you know, we really need to move on adaptation quickly. So given its importance and the additional funding for the LDCF and SECF and the development of a new Jeff adaptation strategy, we developed this decision tree for project developers to ensure that the projects have a robust adaptation rationale. And there's kind of four elements that we think should be asked as you develop these projects. Is it required? Is adaptation required because the climate is changing in a way that is going to have worse hazards or affect human well-being? Um, does the project meet an adaptation need that is recognized and wanted by the stakeholders? Third, does it build on whatever current adaptation efforts there are? And fourth, does it maximize the synergies and minimize the trade-offs between adaptation benefits and the achievement of global environmental benefits? Moving on to natural capital approaches, um, this slide features two Costa Rican wonders of nature. The red-eyed tree frog, that's the one on the left, and the, the CEO, that's the one on the right. <laughs> 
delivering a lecture on natural capital approaches in London at the Royal Society last week. And, and we have talked many times in council about how important it is to promote nature positive, climate positive, people positive approaches simultaneously. So valuing natural capital and the goods and services it provides is absolutely essential. And it can contribute to greater policy coherence too by ensuring that the value of natural capital is factored into policy and decision making Methodologies for natural capital can be complex, and these approaches have often been deployed kind of in a one-time exercise that aren't mainstreamed. But the Jeff A. Program and Directions for Biodiversity Focal Area say that the Jeff will support natural capital approaches that are designed to respond to specific target decisions or policy questions, and that is responding to recommendations by the IEO in its evaluation of the Jeff for mainstreaming biodiversity. So to try to help us all think about that, STAP commissioned the Stanford National Capital Project to examine some 100 trainings they've done and give us advice on how to accelerate the integration of natural capital approaches into the Jeff and increase the uptake by governments, by the MDBs, by businesses, and by local communities. And three key factors seem to be related to success. One is, and I think the CEO has spoken to this in the past too, the involvement of several sectors or several ministries. The second is the presence of a, a clear policy window or mandate. And the third is that they have thought about alternate futures including climate change, that could impact natural capital. So the report is on our website, and um, the report also talks about the potential for something like a future technical assessment facility or an assistance facility, which could provide access to well-established mechanisms and best practices more broadly in the Jeff countries. Um, and, at, and at the London workshop, it was really clear that the private sector, you know, was very eager to make natural capital something they can embed in their thinking about how to make nature an investable asset and a great call for let's get some standardized tools uh, along with valuing carbon so we can marry these two issues. And Jeff just approved um, a medium-sized project that will be looking at 10 countries, five in Asia and five in Africa, with the IDB working with the ADB um, on how to build capacity in these 10 countries that maybe can be a prelude to getting to where Carlos Manuel wants to have 40 to 50 nat cap countries ready by the end of Jeff 8. All right, let me move to observations on the work program. It was not a very big program. Um, but we, we viewed uh, 16 projects. We were, 13 were rated minor and three were completely concur. Um, many projects had a good logic chain, although we always find some underlying assumptions could be strengthened a bit. Um, most projects now do include, as Gustavo said, a climate risk analysis, so it's getting better. And, and one thing that I believe I actually commented on in, in a previous council meeting is that the chemicals and waste projects often have other benefits, for example, in climate change or in international waters, but they don't generally record this. And so those are co-benefits that I think we, we should be trying to take credits for. Um, some highlights from the work program, just mentioning three where we thought there was some interesting uh, logic and uh, new design. So one is enduring earth, and here, this was an interesting way to scale out a sustainable financing model that had already been successfully implemented in a number of other countries, um, but bringing it to Africa and to an area um, that is affected by different pressures in an arid region. And there is a really good South-South knowledge exchange intention. Um, the second one, sustainable land management. This one actually had a very clear land degradation neutrality logic chain. And it talked about applying integrated land use planning on, on what's been called the response hierarchy of avoid, reduce, and reverse. 
And the, uh, li the land degradation neutra neutrality approach, the LDN approach, is rooted in gender, and it recognizes how this influences land users and herders' needs and decisions. And so STAP welcomes the plans to continuously monitor the LDN metrics and core indicators to be sure learning is generated. And the third one on climate smart agricultural systems, this is actually an LDCF project, um, but it had a really interesting in-depth discussion with the stakeholders very early on, which enabled detailed understanding of both the problems to be addressed and a detailed review of possible interventions. Uh, and this project also included multiple plausible climate futures to help inform the selection of interventions that can work across a, a wide range of conditions. And finally, there was a, a very interesting and detailed understanding of gendered differences at the household level. So just some highlights from some of the projects we screened. Um, our future work program. Lots of possibilities. I've outlined some of these as I went through my presentation, so I'm not going to comment on all of them, but just pick out a couple. One, our a report for the assembly will focus on, surprise, surprise, the TRIO, Transformation, Risk, and Innovation. And we're planning to try to have something ready with any additional guidance you might offer um, before or at the December Council meeting. Um, we want to contribute to developing the IPs, and we thank Council and the Jeff Sec for recommending that we be uh, actively involved. We'd like to know what more we can do on policy coherence and on innovation. Uh, we will eventually revise our STAP screening guidelines for, for programs and projects as the Jeff A. Project Information Forum, the PIF Forum, is revised, so we'll be doing that together. Uh, we are willing to hold a workshop on metrics for transformational change. Um, to help think more broadly about Jeff's impact on the economy, we're looking at a review of methodologies that have been used by a number of international organizations. Again, you see kind of a theme here from our papers. We look to see what has been done in both the academic and the practitioner literature and bring these ideas to you. We want to develop training courses, for example, on theories of change or on multi-stakeholder dialogue or policy coherence with country focal points initially, we hope in Latin America and Africa later in the fall. We've been working with William on that. And then we have starting a data and knowledge management platform on Mercury with UNEP and the Minamata Convention. It's something STAP really wanted to do several years ago, but the stars have actually finally um, aligned. And then last, we are looking at what aspects of, I guess I'd call it adaptation services, which could be reduced exposure, reduced sensitivity, or improved adaptive capacity, have been um, pursued across the Jeff LDCF portfolio from uh, Jeff 4 all the way through Jeff 7, and we should be able to report on that by December Council. So let me close in honor of the 30th year of the Small Grants Program. I just want to end with this wonder of nature. It's a six-day-old Malayan taper. The IUCN listed this species as endangered 35 years ago, and there's a population of fewer than 2,500 mature individuals. But these, these strange but wonderful creatures have been around since the Eocene, which is 40 million years ago. And the young ones have this clever forest camouflage with brown hair and white stripes and spots. But the Small Grants Program funded an early initiative for taper conservation on this species in Sumatra more than a decade ago. And that project strengthened community-based forestry management. It assisted in mapping the ecological assets. It worked to create an indigenous conservation site with the taper as the main species, and to develop local economy initiatives, a KM system, and monitoring and evaluation, a complete package in a small grant. And there is now a full-size Jeff project building on this one with the acronym CONSERVE, um, and it's in this same critical <clears throat> biodiversity hotspot, and it's looking at habitat connectivity of particular importance for this Malay taper, as well as uh, the sun bear, the Sumatran tiger, the Sumatran elephant, and the helmeted hornbill. So may this ancient 
but resilient creatures survive, and this little one still be here and flourishing for the small grant program's 50th anniversary. And may we continue to save the wonders of nature, and congratulations to the small grants program. Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rosina for that very passionate, powerful, comprehensive, and very rich report of STEP. Thank you also for reminding, in the context of uh, Jeff and also our council, of the need to have our dialogues, conversations, and even decisions grounded and anchored in science. You have also challenged us to take risks but I think importantly, we also need to know what the risks entail. So with those few words, uh, I open the floor for any questions and comments from the council. I give the floor to Penn, the UK. You have the floor, Penn. Uh, thanks so much, co-chair. and. Um, as always, thank you very much for a great presentation um, and a great set of reports as well uh, with direct relevance to taking forward Jeff 8, including for the integrated programs. Uh, we certainly welcome the Blue Economy Study, looking to see how this will be useful for Jeff in the context of a new integrated programs on the ocean. Uh, and also the, the papers on the plausible futures and policy coherence. And I've, I've got one specific issue and one broader issue that I'd like to raise. I think in, in the context of the important trio you mentioned in terms of transformation, risk, and innovation, um, which is particularly important to Jeff 8 implementation, it was really valuable to see the paper on risk appetite. I think this clearly sets out why it's important for us as the council to be thinking about our risk appetite. And it was helpful to get the, to clarify the difference between, say, fiduciary risks, which obviously we, we consider um, maybe subconsciously in the council, for example, like in the UNDP grievance cases, but also, as the paper says, for Jeff to be truly transformational, um, which is very much needed, um, and to be innovative, uh, you need to then sort of think about the, the systematic issues that needs to recon we need to recognize risks uh, need to be taken to achieve some of that high reward we're trying to achieve on global environmental benefits. Um, I think you said that the STAP's primary recommendation was that Jeff should draft a risk appetite statement, um, and we would very much agree with that. We would like to have a clear timetable for that, and uh, as I think you mentioned also, it'd be great to see that at the uh, December Council so that we can take a decision on that. Um, I think on a, on a broader note, um, there's, there's obviously a huge amount of work that STAP does, and a lot of very, a very valuable work which has gone into the papers that you have produced. Uh, but it's not clear to me how this is being followed through and uh, whether to what extent you're sort of reviewing, monitoring how much these are being taken up um, by the GEF or by us as the council in decisions we're making. Uh, so finally, just to say thank you very much for that, um, and I look forward to your response on those two points. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I give the floor to Tom of Canada to, put, to be followed by Karen of uh, Sweden. Thank you, you Co-Chair. It's always great to follow Ben because I agree with every single word he says. We want transformational impact. We need to define risk properly in order for us to deploy our capital, the most precious one of them all, which is grants and the Jeff family which includes investment banks. I call the World Bank Group an investment bank, and also some very good nature organizations. So we might as well uh, take the time, um, perhaps a subgroup, as our dear uh, staff chair recommended, uh, and then let's deliberate what we want to do, uh, because the Jeff 8 package did include innovation, integrated programs, and all of the things that we want to do in blue, green, and we just need to uh, roll up our sleeves and do it. So I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and do it if others are willing to as well. Thank you, Tom. I 
give the floor to Karen of Sweden to be followed by Gabriel of Switzerland. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we love your uh, presentations. We like the reports and we love the presentations. It's really, it's really both positive but also really looking into the problems that we're facing. Um, and we thank the staff for the informative uh, documents and I just want to raise a few issues. Uh, we, I support what um, Ben was just uh, talking about when it comes to, uh, to risk taking and, um, uh, and we support to the idea of looking further into the issue of, of risk, uh, of informed risk taking and also the, the issue around having a timetable for that and, and a clear and transparent risk framework would be an important tool in that uh, respect. Um, we also welcome the exploration of further refining the tracking of co-benefits in improving human well-being. It's important to also be able to track how well the GEF partnership is achieving transformative change for different segments of populations. Therefore, it's important to focus on gender co-benefits and, and to also include sex and age disaggregated data in any future adjustments of the results measurement framework. And we encourage further work on this to inform the discussion plan for December 2023 council meeting on co-benefits. Um, uh, and we're also very supportive of the staff recommendation for Jeff to adopt a comprehensive framing of policy coherence so as to ensure enduring outcomes of Jeff investments. Policy coherence is really critical to, to the work of, um, uh, of the Jeff and the success of, of the Jeff uh, 8 replenishment. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I give the floor to Gabriela of Switzerland to be followed by Colin of Solomon Islands. Thank you very much, co-chair, and um, thanks to Rosina for the great presentation. It's always one of my favorite agenda items during council meetings. Um, we also fully support what Ben was saying with regards to um, the risk and transformational change uh, aspect. And we also note that this is the one outstanding recommendation we have from OPS7, which wasn't fully tackled in the context of the replenishment. So now we also have a staff recommendation going the same direction. So as a council, we should probably take that up. Um, I have a question to the Jeff Secretariat. Knowing we had the budget conversation yesterday and it was mentioned that uh, staff time is very tight and there's so many demands to implement um, Jeff 8, whether you have sufficient time to actually produce such a risk statement. So the clear baseline um, for risk access, acceptance in GFA programming in particular related to the IPs, because that's where we, I guess, want to aim for the highest degree on innovation. Um, whether you have those resources and you would be ready to prepare a document for adoption for decision at C63. And if not, whether you could give us a timeline by when you could prepare such a document. And then I think procedurally, we probably would have to take a decision to request you to do that by that particular timeline that you could do it. But I think we also have to be careful not to overcharge the Secretariat knowing how much we have asked from you in the context of JF8. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. I give the floor to Colin to be followed by Richard of Australia. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Co-Chair, and I, I join others in thanking um, uh, Dr. Rosina and also all the, pan um, the panelists that actually put this um, together. Um, we certainly um, 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 worried when you made the presentation because I think you, um, you know, um, whatever we do, we have to be guided by science and. Um, I think the information that you shared, certainly um, 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 we would like to uh, support the assessment on uh, you know, the risk. I th we believe that the um, politics of policies must be guided by science and certainly I think the uh, suggestion, you know, the um, coher uh, coherence on, on policy we do um, also um, um, uh, support. Um, the, I think trying to get to 
I'm just trying to, um, whether I've heard you right in terms of the ocean. Um, I come from, uh, the, my constituency um, is surrounded by ocean and we have a lot of uh, interest in that. Um, um, we note the, um, uh, um, the, what science is telling us and whether I've heard you right, 400 and 420 parts per million. Um, if that is correct, I, I hope that is not correct. Um, but if that is correct, then um, I think we are closing. Um, we are closing to a point where, um, uh, once we reach the 550 parts per million, we will see the um, corals and the life as we know it on on the uh, ocean, uh, more or less, um, uh, uh, um, be dissolved. And I think this is where probably. Um, it will be useful as well um, um, in terms of uh, looking at the programs. You, you did make comments on uh, the programs and the projects, et cetera, um, uh, that uh, uh, is under the, um, 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 what we're doing um, with Jeff. Um, I'm just wondering at some point uh, it will be useful to also take a look, come to our constituency and probably try to see, um, you know, um, in terms of uh, contributing to, to the globe in terms of uh, um, uh, being part of the solution, um, to, to try to see um, um, all this, not only the risks, the uh, policy coherence, um, you know, trying to ensure that uh, all this comes together, that whatever we do um, is done in a coherent uh, manner and uh, probably um, maybe to somehow um, have a little bit more focus and uh, pr prioritize the list in terms of what we need to do um, so that we don't uh, try to do too many things and, um, uh, and spread uh, to, uh, our resources too, 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 too thinly. Um, with that, we want, I just want to once again uh, commend uh, the, the work that uh, um, the papers that are being uh, produce as well as the one on, on uh, blue economy. Thank you very much, Co-Chair. Uh, thank you, Colin. Uh, give the floor to Richard to be followed by Rob of uh, United States of America. Thank you, and I guess to reiterate some of the excellent comments that have already been made um, and to recognize the, the excellent work of the staff, it's greatly appreciated uh, as always. Um, I, I'm always mildly horrified when I um, hear the presentations and uh, um, hearing the science about the impacts and uh, I think one of the interesting things I heard uh, recently is that uh, we uh, consume an equivalent of a credit card worth of plastic every uh, week. Um, I'm not sure how accurate that is but um, it's uh, equally horrific but um, I'm not sure if it's um, too far off the mark. Um, but. Just a couple of things. Um, first of all, uh, just picking up on the comments that have already been made about the innovation and risk, um, I um, support the idea of uh, something being pulled together for consideration um, by the uh, the council, um, and including a framework. I, I wonder if, um, and just picking up the, the suggestion of a, a working group, whether that's a, a viable option about how we can um, pull something together uh, maybe that's a discussion we have, can have with Carlos Manuel and the Secretariat subsequently about ensuring we're getting some um, drive and direction uh, through to the, the next meeting. Um, also support the, uh, the, the blue um, paper, I think that was a, an excellent read and uh, really useful and uh, very relevant uh, going to the UN Oceans Conference next week. Uh, as a final comment, um, reading the papers uh, and hearing the presentation, uh, I wonder if there's more opportunity within the meetings to have a bit more depth of um, presentation and discussion on the papers. Uh, they, they are a, a significant resource and I almost feel like they're being underutilised um, and whether there's an opportunity to further tap into the, the, the detail um, and the thinking behind those papers in discussions without consuming too much time. But um, it would be good to explore opportunities to um, work at how we can draw more from the reports and the excellent work that STAP's doing um, beyond the, uh, the presentation uh, to, to uh, integrate it into the work of the, the Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I give the floor to Rob of uh, United States of America to be followed by Renee of Netherlands.
Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Co-Chair, and thank you, Rosina, for that very informative presentation. I always really appreciate the species that you focus on. I always learn from, from you about those species, something new always every time, so I really appreciate that. Um, we, we appreciate the thoughtful approach the staff takes to ensuring that Jeff interventions are grounded in sound science and welcome these documents. I do need to note, though, and probably many around the table won't be surprised to hear this, that the United States doesn't believe that the planet planetary boundaries framing is particularly representative of sound science, nor that it's really a policy-ready concept. That notwithstanding, we always appreciate your presentations and leadership, Rosina, and the staff's impact on Jeff programming. We particularly appreciate the information brief on knowledge management and learning. Strengthening these strategies will allow the Jeff to magnify its global impacts. We would be interested in hearing about the outcomes from the proposed workshop with the staff, Jeff Secretariat, and Jeff agencies. We also are interested in seeing how the recommendations on co-benefits will be implemented. There is, of course, a balance to strike between capturing the impacts of the Jeff and the administrative burden of reporting. This initial focus on the prerequisite co-benefits will increase understanding of the additional benefits derived from Jeff projects and improve project design and sustainability. We do have some concerns that we'd appreciate addi additional information on. The first is whether the technical assistance facility suggested by Stanford would add significantly to the ability of countries to implement natural capital accounting. We know there are many demands for Jeff funding and we want to ensure new initiatives have a demonstrable value add and are not action supported via the country support program and, and are not actions um, supported via the country support program or a staff briefing. The second is in regard to the design of the integrated program for Jeff programs for Jeff aid. We found the document on achieving transformation through Jeff investment very informative and we're surprised to realize the integrated approach pilots in Jeff 6 and even in IPs in Jeff 7 were not really designed to succeed when scaled. We would like to know how the Jeff Secretariat intends to use this information in the forthcoming months for the Jeff 8 integrated programs and what steps can be taken to ensure the Jeff 8 integrated programs are capable of being scaled. The recommendations in these documents will continue to shape and improve Jeff 8 and beyond and thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. I give the floor to Rene of uh, Netherlands to be followed by Yoshiko of uh, Japan. Yes, thank, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you for what was a very interesting, inspiring, and an excellent presentation. Um, I, I thought it was very important that you highlighted that the interlinkages between climate change mitigation and biodiversity are seldom integrated in management plans and policies, and of course, the, the, the COP processes of bio, for biodiversity and climate are very much stovepiped. So I'd also like to learn from the Jeff Secretariat how they see their role in, in, well, well, in, in getting rid of those stovepipes and, and, and contributing to a more integrated approach. And of course, we all around the table realize that we also have to, um, to improve our own uh, performance in that respect. Um, moreover, we, we, we welcome the efforts to refine the tracking of co-benefits in future Jeff investments. Uh, as outlined in the uh, revised policy recommendation for Jeff 8. And we also feel it's important that the capture of human and socioeconomic well-being metrics is improved. Um, we also see it's important that the, the climate change adaptation co-benefits in results, they require monitoring, and, um, and, and also in the design of Jeff projects, it's also that it's also well-developed. Um, we also think that Jeff projects can play a significant role in adaptation efforts, and that that should be taken into account when capturing results. Um, of course, we, we, we fully support the step suggestion to add co-benefits to the results measurement framework program scorecard, um, so that the co-benefits may be more easily tracked. So that was my short introduction, but thank you very much for your important work. Thank you, Rene. I give the floor to Yoshiko of Japan to be followed by Sano of the CSO Network. Well, thanks so much to the staff for this fascinating pre presentation. I really uh, echo the comments uh, made by my fellow colleagues here. 
I just wanted to quickly chime in on the importance of the risk uh, discussion and, and chime in on the importance of clarifying or defining uh, this to achieve transformational means for us to achieve the global environment total benefits. But I also wanted to caution and point out the importance that any analysis or recommendation of risk should not be too overarching and sweeping across and also pay heed to the importance that analysis of risk increasingly needs to be context specific, how it applies to specific themes, regions, countries, conflict sensitive situations, especially as we also need to manage the reputational risk and political ramifications of the Jeff. And also I uh, just urge that the need to couple this work with the risk measurement and reporting as well, but also uh, would like to echo a point uh, raised by Switzerland about the need to think about the ramification of Jeff resources when we conduct this work. And also should there be a working group uh, set up in this area, it needs to be very well balanced in its uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshiko. I give the floor to Sano. Very good morning. And thank you very much. On behalf of the GFCSO network, we appreciate the presentation made by the staff chair. It is really very good. And when I listen to her presentations, my attention goes to in depth to the presentation and very little time for taking notes. But it is very good that uh, it is outstanding. So she pointed out several very, very important things. One is climate change and biodiversity are addressed differently. Not only these two, there are many other things. So how better, what is their recommendation, how better this GF8 can add value to make these um, isolated uh, programs in more con um, integrated way so that it can make more higher values. Innovation, innovation is one of the very important part of the GF8. So from the scientific perspectives and programming perspectives, what is particular recommendation she has for this. And all this will make this transformational change and we are, uh, we are waiting to experience this uh, great opportunity to reduce the risk globally. Knowledge management, learning, uh, this is that we have been talking a lot and we, we think that it should be information included because currently knowledge management is mainly information sharing. It is not yet that level of dynamics. So knowledge management should be a dynamic approach and uh, the recommendation from scientific, this team, it will be helping value. Policy coherence, this is the most important part and we have seen how these two birds are working together uh, and duplicating and replicating. So. Uh, how better, what is their perspectives, how better this policy coherence can work more. Uh, one of the recommendation is from our side is that this, every policy coherence um, implemented by the agencies and others, it, they have their own policy. So uh, most of the cases we see, the, it, the same message goes in different way. So for that, we recommend to have guidance manual for every policy so that everyone is speaking the same language. At last, the observation, excellent thing um, uh, presented, but gender and indigenous people's issues are not, we have not seen there. So in the future work pro program, we want to see gender not as a participant, gender as an actor. And it, similarly, indigenous people are an actor to make the enhanced process for transformation change. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sano, for your intervention. And uh, I give the floor to Julian of uh, Ancola to be followed by Renato of Brazil. Julian, you have the floor. Yeah, the, thank you, uh, Mr. Koshe. Um, the Southern Africa constituency uh, just asked the floor to welcome the brilliant presentation that has been made and also to, to say that we are excited to be part, uh, continue to be part of the program, and we support the suggestions that you have just presented. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, the last uh, speaker is uh, Renato of Brazil. You have the floor, Renato. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, just like I'm going to be very brief. Uh, we'd just like to. Um, First of all, uh, welcome the Rosina's presentation. I think it was very interesting, as usual. I'd just like to make a brief comment on the use of some constant expressions on the document. 
Um, sometimes we, we hear uh, expressions like um, nature positive, uh, blue and green economy, and uh, some, sometimes those languages are not yet uh, um, multilaterally agreed. So I know that uh, steps must respond to the council and then the council re responds to the conventions through the guidance. So, um, so perhaps uh, there, there is, uh, perhaps uh, we should refrain from using uh, language that is sometimes too prescriptive. And, uh, and particularly on nature-based solutions that was mentioned on the, on the, on the document, we agree there's a definition of nature-based solutions. Um, but however, there's uh, also uh, on, the, on the definition uh, that, was, um, uh, that was agreed on uh, uh, by UNAP, uh, uh, I think there's uh, also uh, uh, the need to come um, um, uh, with the um, uh, within the understanding, because there is, um, uh, uh, together with the definition of nature-based solutions, there's also, um, there, was, uh, there was also um, at the need to, to convene intergovernmental consultations to achieve a common understanding among member states for the implementation of nature-based solutions. So I would like to, uh, perhaps uh, when we use a concept like nature-based solution, Perhaps it would be better to also reflect this, uh, the need to, uh, to, to have this common understanding among mem member states for the implementation of nature-based solutions on the document too. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Renato. Uh, Germany wants to take the floor. Please do so. Thank you, Chair. Um, and dear Rosina, first I would really like to applaud you, as others already did, that you always find the most brilliant pictures that represent nature's riches, and you especially got me with the baby tap here this time. Um, Germany welcomes the STEP report and would like to highlight the STEP's recommendations to follow the guidance on risk appetite and establishing a baseline for risk acceptance and Jeff 8 programming and to, to develop a risk appetite framework. Further, as others, we welcome the STAP's work on co-benefits and innovation, and I would also like to echo Gabriela's point on seeing a further paper on risk in C63. Finally, and looking into the future, we are also looking forward to the upcoming report with an analysis of the adaptation services in the LDCF uh, project portfolio, which I think will also be very important in guiding us in uh, GEF 8. Thank you. Thank you, Germany. I give the floor to Senat of uh, Bosnia. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Co-Chair, very much. Uh, thank you, Rosina, for excellent presentation. And this is something what we uh, actually expected from the staff. Staff really work excellent and uh, present us excellent review on environmental issues and environmental problems in the world. Uh, for my opinion, I think it could be good that all constituency get some kind of uh, uh, some kind of environmental review uh, in each constituency with support of the staff. If it is possible, it would be more, more than welcome in my constituency. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I think uh, that was the, the last. Uh, Council member to take the floor. I think the breadth and scope of questions posed and uh, observations made and even suggestions means that uh, we can probably have a full day having this, kind, this discussion. So I'll give the, the floor to Dr. Rosina with a request to respond as briefly as possible to the questions that have been posed, mindful that uh, we are sort of running a bit late in terms of, uh, of our agenda and timing. So you have the floor, Dr. Rosin. <laughs> Thank you, co-chair. I won't show my other 35 PowerPoints then. Um, d just a, a couple of things. Many of the, the questions and comments really do reflect uh, questions to Jeff Sack. I'm very uh, pleased that the risk appetite is resonating with so many of you. Um, as you all know, you know, you asked that STAP tell you ahead of time what we're working on, so that's why you're hearing about some things that are underway and some things we've taken up having talked to you. We try to scan the horizon for what new things are out there, and we try to take your needs back out to our communities. Um, 
you ask, uh, I think this was the UK, how much follow-up there is. I just want to say I think we have an extremely good relationship um, with the Jeff family. I have a monthly call with the CEO, and our staff communicate to the program managers regularly. Um, climate risk screening is something that we kind of imposed, and I think uh, that ended up being really helpful because many of the agencies already had it, and it was good that we brought that forward. So, so I think a lot of our ideas that are in the science domain are adopted. A lot of our other ideas are bringing new ideas on uh, what can go forward. Uh, on the, um, uh, let's see, on the Solomon Islands, yes, we're at 420, and yes, sea level rise is increasing. Um, the Biodiversity and climate change, several of you raised as things that should be thought about together. And, and I do think if we don't you know, value nature while we're valuing carbon, we're gonna lose a great opportunity to get what has been identified as a third of the emission reductions we need still this decade to have a prayer of even staying below um, two degrees. Um, more depth on our papers. If this had been a normal council, which it's not, we would have set aside three hours to have a conversation with council members, Jeff SAC, agencies, to, to do exactly um, what was suggested, I think, by Australia, that we talk more depth about the papers, but we're happy to do that individually as well. Planetary Boundaries US, I, I actually agree with you. But I have to say the private sector loves knowing there's a line that when you pass it, you've gone past it. And so it, it's an interesting, um, metric of sorts. Um, let's see, I've already, uh, I guess I just want to, uh, Brazil, yes, of course, words matter, and you're right, we need to be very careful. I mean, I worry that um, resilience has become a word that can mean everything to everyone, much like sustainability does. Um, I guess I just want to say two things. One, because the IPs are a third of the replenishment money, it seems to me that if you want to try some new things in risk, in policy coherence, in transformation, in innovation, in tracking co-benefits, this would probably be the place to start. You can't impose it on every individual project, but I think that would be a good idea. Um, secondly, um, on innovation, I, I didn't hear any comments on this, but I do want to suggest you know, there may be ways we can think about how to use the innovation window or the composite of, of medium-sized projects um, as a whole. And I think in the interest of not exceeding any more time, Co-Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we've uh, talked to uh, Rosina's uh, responses. I think we've uh, successfully concluded our consideration of agenda item eight, report of the chairperson of staff. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there is no decision to be adopted. So with that, I suggest we move on to our next agenda item. Oh, so, sorry, I, I see Gabriel uh, wants to sorry, take the floor. Sorry, Co-Chair. Um, I think there were many questions to the Jeff Secretariat around the risk issue, so it would seem necessary that we get some responses to that, and especially if we want this paper to be prepared by C63 or later dates, we may also have to take a decision recommending or requesting the secretary to do that. So I think we maybe need to get at least one response from the secretary on that. Thanks. Uh, point well taken. Sorry for the oversight on this. It was uh, not deliberate. So I'll give the floor to the secretary to respond to the questions that have been asked specifically by Gabriel. Yes, Gabriela, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. I will be addressing that question and a few comments that I do have um, uh, later on. I'm a little bit worried that we have the secretaries of the conventions waiting online for us, uh, some of them in Nairobi and other places. So yes, I, I would um, address that um, directly with you and the other council members that would like to, uh, to engage in this conversation. And thanks uh, for bringing it. Thank, thank you, Carlos, for that. Uh, so now we move on to agenda item 16, which is uh, relations with conventions and other international organizations. Uh, this agenda item has three sections. The first section will include uh, presentations by the executive secretaries of the conventions that the chief serves. Each will share his or her perspective on the chief aid replenishment and the outcomes of the conference of parties and key meetings held since the last council meeting in December 2021. 
In the second section, we will hear a briefing on COP15 outcomes by the Deputy Executive Secretary of uh, UNCCD. And the third section will be a consideration of the report on, re on relations with conventions and other international organizations. Before we have the presentation by the Executive Secretaries, I want to give the floor to the Chair, Carlos Manuel, for some uh, opening remarks. You have the floor, Carlos. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. As um, I indicated uh, the, uh, yesterday in the, in the opening remarks, uh, I've been able to, uh, to attend uh, three COPs of the conventions that uh, we work and respond to Minamata, the BRS, and the uh, Land Degradation Conventions. All of this, um, as we were finishing the, the replenishment process, and yes, of course, we all um, know and understand that um, we have uh, ongoing processes with regards to CBD COP15. This weekend, uh, we received the latest information from the Bureau and from the larger the CBD community with regards to the organization of, um, of the COP. And, this, and then, of course, um, Egypt um, is organizing in Sharm el Sheikh uh, COP, COP27. We're, we're participating actively in all of these COPs, uh, not just as the, as the financial mechanism, but most importantly, uh, responding to the, to the will, aspiration, and needs uh, from all parties. We, we, we need to really understand that um, there's important, um, important um, uh, mandates coming from the COP to the GEF. And our work is um, to align that, uh, that mandate with the programming and, and policies aspects of, uh, of the GEF, uh, particularly nowadays that uh, we, we look uh, into GEF uh, aid. With all the many different challenges that uh, we've been discussing for, for the last two years. I personally want to recognize uh, the great effort that uh, Ibrahim Tiao, Andrea Mesa did uh, with regards to the UNCCD COP in, in Abidjan, uh, as well as uh, our dear friends uh, Rolf Pajet with regards to the second segment of the uh, BRR, uh, BRS, particularly on this uh, great initiative of having the high-level segment in Stockholm and then um, the rest of the COP matters uh, yeah, in Geneva. And just, of course, our dear friend Monica, with regards to the Minamata Convention happening early this uh, year in Bali, Indonesia. I was able to personally attend all of them. And I was, um, it was a great opportunity for multiple uh, exchange and, and feedback, particularly from me with the parties, with the Bureau, for with the stakeholders. Um, uh, these conventions are extremely important to me because of the work that I do with non-state actors, particularly CSO and the private sector. I want to co personally congratulate one small Rolf, uh, Monica, uh, Ibrahim, and Andrea for the fabulous work on being able to end uh, those uh, COPs in a very successful manner. I don't have any doubt that the same thing that will happen uh, in COP15 and COP27. Uh, All of them extremely critical and extremely important in the context of, um, of our aspiration uh, for the long-term goal of the system change. And yes, uh, definitely there's a strong alignment in our, or in our overarching goals of uh, mobilizing financial resources from all sources on our overarching objective of impact and sustainable impacts and just definitely the need to more integration across the multiple conventions. Um, never before I seen uh, so much the topic of uh, nature come to these two conventions as uh, we saw it uh, this year. And definitely this is a game changer and it's an opportunity and at the same time it's a, it's a major responsibility. Um, I had a strong background in nature conservation, and yes, land use change may be the best known uh, driver for loss of nature, uh, for nature um, uh, loss, but chemicals and waste is becoming the major driver of, uh, 
nature loss, biodiversity loss at the planet. You know, the other day, I wanted to share this personal impression. Eight days ago, I, uh, before, coming, before coming to the US, um, I went surfing to one of my favorite beaches in Costa Rica, 45 years going into the, this beach. When I began surfing there 45 years ago, it was pristine, teeming with nature, and today it's full of plastic, full of plastic. Uh, my heart was broken to see what uh, we're doing with the oceans and with the land and the resources. Very, very impressed. I took a lot of photos and um, I show it to my kids because um, they don't know what this used to be. And the chemicals and waste uh, is uh, a main issue. I also came very happy uh, out of the, um, the Abidjan COP because people began to really connect that drought and desertification is a major issue hitting uh, frontier communities. The frontier communities that are in the, those uh, drylands beyond the Sahel, uh, where the desert is growing two, three kilometers per year. Out of that COP, all parties recognize that drought and degradation is not just an issue of Sahel nations. Every single country in the planet is subject to land degradation. And we'll never achieve any progress in terms of our aspiration for the 1.5 and eventually for the 30% if we don't put the Land Degradation Convention in the center of everything that we do. So I feel um, very happy that um, the multiple ideas that uh, we present to you all during the replenishment has resonated one way or another in, in all of the conventions that we respond. I, 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 I came back with a lot of um, enthusiasm to see the, the, the mindset of the parties looking at the landscape and, and, and the seascapes. And, and, and this is where the Jeff is, is, uh, is moving. The Jeff as a dedicated mechanism for the convention will be a positive force of action at the landscape and, and seascape uh, level looking to impact across the different conventions where the focal areas and the impact programs comes together in ways that can generate a small impact. But we need to work more with the civil society. We need to work more with private sector. These were issues that were important. The Jeff, you all, will be providing strategic funding to the CSOs, to the civil society organizations that work in the land degradation, the certification convention. And this is something that excites me a lot to see how the Jeff is spreading the, the benefits in creating the, the opportunities to really, uh, so we can really have higher impact. And of course, all of this happened as we went to Stockholm. And in Stockholm, we, we were forced to really look back to 1972 and to look into the future. And even though the beach I go surfing is full of plastic, today, and it wasn't as such 45 years ago, I'm extremely optimist. I'm a rational optimist. I use the science, I use the data, and definitely we got um, the financial resources, we got the technology. We need the political buy-in, and that is why policy coherence and supporting the countries to mobilize resources from all sources is the way forward so we can achieve that ultimate goal of uh, helping countries align all the public and private investment with the conventions, with the conventions that um, we respond, and also to many other conventions that even though the GF is not the financial mechanism, one way or another, we uh, contribute and we work. CITES, Ramsar, migratory conventions, uh, regional conventions, are extremely important in this context. So that holistic approach uh, is relevant and important. And even though I felt a little bit some, some level of frustration and anger uh, out of uh, what we talk and discuss in Stockholm, I'm extremely optimistic that uh, we will uh, be able to, to give our children a, a world that has connected 
the dots in terms of action, connected the dot towards the transition uh, to a circular economy, uh, whereby uh, all uh, actors, and I want to highlight once more, all actors, uh, in particular civil society actors, are key players into this. There will be a new paradigm in terms of the multilater multilateralism as we understand it, and we need to prepare for that. And the CSOs uh, will be an important stakeholder in this. So um, uh, with this, um, Chair, um, um, I'll pass it over to you, and I want to congratulate once more uh, the secretaries of the convention for the great success in the different COPs, and our the biggest commitment to uh, support the ongoing uh, processes uh, towards uh, COP15 and COP27. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carlos uh, Manuel, for that very timely update, and also for putting a, a personal face uh, in terms of some of the problems we are facing, like, for instance, the reference to plastic pollution. Well, I think it remains for me, uh, on behalf of our council, to warmly welcome the four executive secretaries who are present, some virtually and some here in person, to address the council in the following order. Firstly, it would be Ms. Patricia Espinosa, the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, who will be uh, sharing with us a video message. And then it would be Elizabeth Maruma, Rema, the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, also virtual participation. Mr. Ralph Bayet, Executive Secretary of the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Conventions, who will be joining us in person. And Ms. Monica, who is the Executive Secretary of the Minamata Convention on Mercury, who is uh, we're blessed to have with us in person. So give the floor now to uh, Patricia Espinosa for a video message. Dear Council members, warm greetings from Bonn. I'm grateful for the opportunity to make a few comments during the 62nd Jeff Council. There is no need to dwell on the gravity of our climate crisis. Over the past 10 months, the IPCC has released three reports with the most up-to-date science on climate change. Dr. Ho-Sung Lee, the IPCC chair, recently summarized those findings by simply stating that, and I quote, climate change is a grave and a mounting threat to our well-being and a healthy planet, unquote. He also reminded us that we still have time to act, though it is quickly running out. To limit the average global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement, will take immediate and unprecedented action from every country. Glasgow signaled a renewed collective determination to tackle this challenge. Turning that determination into action requires a wide array of instruments from legislation to policy, from technology to capacity building. Nearly all of them depend in one way or another on the availability of adequate and predictable financial support. As a UNFCCC's financial mechanism, the Global Environmental Facility has a critical role to play in financing the transition to a low emission and climate resilient development. Hence, the importance of the GEF's periodic replenishment. I welcome the record level of pledges achieved, amounting to more than 5.3 billion US dollars for the period 2022 to 2026. I am sure we all would have liked the figure to be even higher, considering the daunting challenges that the climate emergency poses to developing countries and the scale of investment they require. Even so, the GEF aid replenishment outcomes point in several ways to a strengthening of the GEF's role as a key source of finance for climate change 
and sustainable development. Through its expanded impact programs, the GEF will ensure that climate action pervades virtually all its portfolios, breaking silence across environmental issues and enhancing its potential impact. It will support mitigation, promoting technology transfer and innovation in the areas of energy, mobility, and nature-based solutions. It will pave the way for a growing number of country-driven environmental projects with accredited climate benefits. And it is committed to increase its support to the Enhanced Transparency Framework of the Paris Agreement, reinforcing trust among parties and stakeholders. This is a way to respond to the IPCC's findings and to support the collective determination shown a few months ago in Glasgow with clear, resolute action. I count on the GEF to fulfill the promise it holds to developing countries, that they will not be left alone and their ambitious climate actions will be supported. Dear friends, this is my last address to the GEF Council as head of UN Climate Change. I would like to say so long, not goodbye, as I intend to continue supporting global climate action as a private citizen, with one single recommendation to the GEF and to all entities involved in climate finance. It may be better described as a petition. As you deliberate on policy and decide on projects, keep in mind the IPCC's sobering warnings and think carefully about their implications for developing countries seeking financial support. All else, enhanced resources, more expedient procedures, and stronger accountability is likely to follow. I and many others count on the GEF to fulfill with ever-growing success its critical mission. Once again, congratulations on previous achievements and best wishes for the work ahead. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Patricia Espinosa for a farewell statement and remarks in the context of, our, of the Chief Council meeting. I now give the floor to Elizabeth Remba, the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, for a virtual uh, statement. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Co-Chair, and equally thank you very much, Carlos, and greetings to you all. I want to send my sincere congratulations to the Jeff 8 replenishment participants and the Jeff Council on the successful conclusion of the Jeff 8 replenishment negotiations on time against the backdrop of the continuing adverse impacts from the COVID-19 pandemic. The success was marked by the historical level of pledged new funding as well as the, by the remarkable agreement on a series of reform measures towards the transformative changes. Applause should also go to Carlos Manuel, the trustee, the Jeff Secretariat team for their leadership, practical idealism, and sustained professionalism in carefully facilitating the progression of the intergovernmental negotiations in such a difficult time. The results speaks for itself. By substantially increasing both absolute terms and relative terms of pledges to biodiversity, your message to the world is clear and loud. Biodiversity matters and all lives matter. And you have walked the talk, not in small steps, but big ones. Through the integrated approach to programming and other innovations, biodiversity objectives will be addressed not only in the biodiversity focal area, but also by related interventions on climate change, land and water, as well as chemical pollution. There is no better gift
from the financial mechanism to the process of elaborating to the elaborating the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. The ongoing negotiations on post 2020 framework should certainly build upon the positive results of the GF8 replenishment. With the council's approval of the last GF7 work program yesterday, the approved GF7 funding for biodiversity projects has mounted up to 1.1 one eight eight billion in the past four year cycle. The GF8 pledge of almost two million two billion dollars for biodiversity indicates an increase of almost 62 percent for the next four years if fully and effectively utilized in time. A good post 2020 global biodiversity framework should mobilize a matching global ambition of the about 62% increase over the next four years to enable effective, efficient, and impactful use of the increased GEF resources. A further increase of 23.8% for biodiversity at the GEF 9 replenishment does not look like a ridiculous tall call for the moment, but it will imply that GEF funding for biodiversity will have been doubled by 2030. A good post-2020 global biodiversity framework will need to match up with doubled, if not more, overall results and impacts in the next eight years by 2030. To this end, the, the task before the present fourth, uh, present fourth meeting of the open-ended working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework is inevitably daunting. Starting from where it left off at the third meeting in Geneva, the working group will have to advance substantially and decisively the negotiations towards a post-2020 global biodiversity framework for adoption by the 15th meeting of the conference of the parties to the convention and it, the conjunctive meetings of the parties to its protocols now decided to be held in Montreal at the hosting city of the Secretariat in December from 5th to 17th. Principally, this includes addressing each of the main drivers of biodiversity loss, but also importantly, the underlining economic and social drivers, as well as promoting the importance of integrating biodiversity into national sectorial and cross-sectorial planning, principally mainstreaming and integrated approaches to implementation of related instruments and objectives by all stakeholders through the whole of government and whole of society approaches. The GF8 Biodiversity Focal Area Strategy has responded directly to all the elements of the objectives of the convention and its protocols, including conservation, sustainable use, and benefit sharing and funding, and thus will be supportive of the implementation of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. As an integral element of the convention and its protocols, financial mechanism is firmly embedded into the agenda of the 15th meeting of the conference of the parties to the convention and to the meetings of the parties to its protocols. Under the agenda item on financial mechanism, parties will build upon the report of the GEF Council for the period from 1st July 2018 to 31st December 2021 and consider to provide further guidance to the financial mechanism, including a four-year outcome-oriented work pro program of work for, uh, framework priorities and determining, uh, be able to determine funding needs. Three intersessional meetings were held this past March in Geneva, in person, first time in two years. At the third meeting of the open-ended working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework in Geneva, 
delegates pronounce the first aggregated text of goals, targets, and supporting mechanisms for further negotiations towards the post-2020 framework for nature and made good progress towards a solution for the fair and equitable sharing of benefits from digital sequencing information on the use of genetic resources. The resumed meetings of the subsidiary body on scientific, technical, and technological advice, as well as the subsidiary body on implementation, adopted a set of recommendations on a wide range of thematic and cross-cutting issues. These outcomes of the triple meetings have already prepared a substantial base for deliberations on the financial mechanisms at the 15th meeting of the Conference of the Parties. Already through the United Nations Development Program and the United Nations Environment Program, the GEF demonstrated its capability of rapidly conceptualizing and approving the much needed critical early action grants for national planning in response to a post-2020 global biodiversity framework. As learned from the process of nationally determined contributions to the Climate Change Agreement, timely promotion of early national planning will undoubtedly contribute to the successful adoption of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework and jumpstart of its implementation, including strategic, institutional, capacity, and resource alignment. Last, but definitely not least, I've been pleased to note Carlos's commitment and enthusiasm to enhance the coordination and collaboration between the two secretariats. And I'm happy to pledge the same and even more as we move forward. There are opportunities to achieve effectiveness, efficiency, and impacts at scale by working together. Only by working together can we expect an outcome that will be fundamentally better by the year 2030. Thank you very much. I thank uh, Executive Secretary Elizabeth Rema of Convention on Biological Diversity for a very comprehensive uh, statement. I now give the floor to Mr. Ralph Barriott, Executive Secretary, Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, who is uh, here with us this, uh, af this afternoon for his uh, statement. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Co-Chair. I have a presentation. Ah, there we go. So I will dive in straight into the outcomes of our face-to-face -face segments of the Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm Conventions, which was held in the last two weeks and which ended on Friday evening. Um, so uh, we had, I can barely read here. I need to change my glasses. <laughs> Frank, can you bring the, the laptop? Because otherwise I cannot see what I'm supposed to be reading. Sorry about this. Probably you can read, I can't. <laughs> Sorry, this? Yes, if I can fully full screen. Ah, that's better. Thank you. Over there, everybody can see it. I can look at it this way, but then you have to microphone. This way. No, it's okay, they're putting it full screen. It's on there? Thank you. So the online segment was from the 26th to the 30th of July 2021. And uh, during that segment, of course, we dealt with the budget, but an important other aspect was, of course, the guidance to the GEF, and that were continued um, in the face-to-face -face event. We also organized a high-level segment. There's been a lot of mention of Stockholm Plus 50. Um, the idea came from the Bureau, who suggested that we elevate the high-level segment to a more international meeting than our meetings. Of course, our meetings are international, but they, they wanted to, because since uh, Stockholm Plus 50 was inspired, in fact, by pollution from Russia Carson's book on pollution uh, and, and impact on wildlife and also on impact on humans, we felt it was fitting that we have the high HLS 
in connection with the Stockholm Plus 50. And of course, after some discussions, we were, uh, we were allowed to organize the event together with the Stockholm Plus 50. And at that event, we had over 100 ministers that came. And uh, this is a photo of all the ministers. We had Carlos Manuel as well, who joined us on the panel. I gave him the task of coordinating the panel on financing and how we can, we can enable um, action on the ground in terms of uh, chemicals and waste. I think it's been mentioned before by my uh, two other executive secretary colleagues that we, we're working very hard to, to bridge uh, the secretariats uh, of the MEAs and the secretariats of, of the GEF and ensuring that the parties also to the, to the three conventions uh, uh, of which I'm the executive secretary of uh, are engaged and also aware of the work that the GEF is doing. And that was, that was essentially uh, why we got Carlos Manuel on one of the panels in the ministerial segment. The outcomes of the ministerial segment is available on our website. I won't go through them today, but they are very political statements which highlight the priorities and needs of the ministers are present. There we had ministers from uh, all the continents, I would say. Uh, next, ah, okay. This is our face-to-face -face segment of the BRIS COPS, which were last week, and uh, we, we have decisions, a number of decisions on the three conventions. I will spend, of course, more time on the Stockholm Convention, as this is, uh, the GEF is the financial mechanism for the Stockholm Convention. So we first had the inclusion of PFH excess uh, and its salts uh, listed on the Annex A of the Stockholm Convention. Then the COPS of Stockholm also uh, adopted new guidance on uh, BAT and BEP. BAT is Best Available Techniques, Best Environment Practices for Persistent Organic Pollutants. These are very useful for use not only by industry, but by the different countries in implementation of, uh, of uh, POPs management and POPs elimination. Third area of work uh, that came out of this COP was a process to provide information on cases of trade. This is emerging work uh, and it's an important one because uh, it is essentially looking at uh, the issue of trade between countries with regards to POPs and also the role the Basel Convention plays. And here you can see it's building on the positive experience under the Basel Convention. Uh, which has a similar process. So there's lessons learned from the Basel Convention here. And, <clears throat> and of course, Jeff A. Triple Nishment was definitely very much uh, part of the discussion. And on the adoption of the financial mechanisms decision, many, many uh, parties express uh, their satisfaction. I'm covering that satisfaction here with the, with the work of the Jeff Council and the Jeff especially with the increase in the GEF of portfolio for the chemicals and wastes. I'm just highlighting a few important areas here, which is, uh, uh, which is important in terms of upcoming deadlines. As you know, the COP set up a target for, for the phase out of PCBs 2025 and 2028. And these deadlines are uh, within a few years. And uh, we've been having discussions here with uh, a, number of, uh, uh, a number of delegations here and also a number of organizations to see how we can put uh, together a strategy in the next uh, three to five years and within the aid replenishment, uh, a ramped up strategy for us to address uh, you know, with the resources that have been allocated the maximum possible uh, elimination of PCBs especially in the three regions uh, that, we, that we've identified, uh, which is uh, the Grulak region, the African region, and the Asian region, and also the CE region. Um, uh, the, the COP urged and requested the GEF to explore feasible options available to provide enhanced support for PCB management and disposal. So we've already started this discussion barely a few days after this decision was adopted. Um, and I think there are opportunities that we can explore to see how we can leverage the, especially the, the, the aid replacement portfolio, which has just been approved, to address uh, those uh, looming deadlines. 
In terms of uh, guidance to the financial mechanism, which I mentioned before, there are priority areas of work for the period 2022-2026. That is, of course, PCBs, but also the newly listed POPs, uh, with a focus on brominated flame retardants, fluorinated POPs, and chlorinated paraffins. Uh, don't want, as I always say, I don't want to go into the details of these chemicals here, but they are important and, and uh, we need to have uh, uh, projects and uh, attention by, by the GEF on these new listed POPs as well. There's also the issue of POPs pesticides, including obsolete stockpiles, which uh, is an outstanding issue that we, we need to address. There's the issue of DDT. There's the issue of unintentional produced POPs, and that is something that I share also with my colleagues, Executive Secretary from the Minimata Convention as well, and other, and other, and other sources from other, uh, other, other facilities. And, uh, and of course, I want to reiterate and the need for the continued support for the national implementation plans and the global monitoring program, which we feel is a very important area of work, which gives us a sense of whether the convention is it's actually achieving its objectives. Uh, briefly, in terms of the Rotterdam Convention, we have the inclusion of uh, the two industrial chemicals in Annex 3 of the convention. To note that these two chemicals are already listed under the Stockholm Convention, so, so it's now been listed in the Rotterdam Convention, so it will be subject to the prior informed consent. If you're asking why are they listed under the Rotterdam Convention. Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, compliance mechanism, there was uh, agreement on the work program for the compliance mechanism. Obviously, these are just highlights I'm giving you today. Under the Basel Convention, we have a new amendment to the convention and um, uh, annexes to seven, um, seven, eight, seven. And seven eight, and nine, uh, which relates to e-waste. So now all e-waste are subject to the PIC procedure. Again, I won't go into a lot of detail here. And of course, the COP ad adopted a swathe of technical guidelines. Um, <clears throat> uh, mercury waste, which is of course linked to Minimata. The SM of waste from persistent organic pollutants, which is related to, um, uh, to Stockholm Convention, and this has been updated. And of course, other, other technical guidelines. There were also other decisions which were, which were adopted, and uh, especially on waste lead acid batteries and other decisions. In terms of joint issues, as you know, the three conventions operate under a secretariat, although they are independent in terms of the, both the, the operation and the decision making, but uh, the COPs have also identified joint issues that are shared between the three conventions, and one of those, of course, is international cooperation. And uh, under this discussion, there's uh, increased uh, demand, I would say, or interest that we, we, we work closely with uh, industry, with the civil society, and seeing how we engage with them. And of course, there was a renewed mandate for us to continue to support the new uh, INC on uh, the development of an international treaty on uh, plastic, uh, and of course, in support of the science policy panel as well, which are two key resolutions coming out of UNIA 5.2. And there was also agreement for the next COPs to be held in the Bahamas in 2023. That is a year from now. I think I've reached the end. And this is just a bit of good news in our outreach. We managed to get Piers Brosnan and his son Paris to support the three conventions. And this article is just out now, this morning, in the People magazine. And they have a video as well, which they've uh, they've worked with us on, and this is also public now uh, on our website and everywhere. And I think this will give uh, a boost to the awareness we're trying to create, especially on the work that we do under the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm Conventions, but as well on the issues of plastics. Uh, with those few words, uh, Mr. Co-Chair, thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Executive 
Secretary, Mr. Rolf Bayet, for his uh, presentation. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's my pleasure to hand the floor over to my neighbor, Ms. Monica, the Executive Secretary of the Minamata Convention on Mercury, for her presentation. You have the floor, madam. Thank you so much. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, dear Carlos Manuel, uh, dear Culture Ambassador Feturi, Council members and alternate ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be with you here and meet you in person. Let me join those who spoke yesterday in congratulating Jeff CEO, Secretariat, the trustee, all contributors and partners for a historic Jeff 8 replenishment. On behalf of the Minamata Convention, thank you so much. I hope you still have an energy left for one more presentation. I think there is a lot required of you, so I thank you in, advan in advance for your attention. And I will do something which I usually don't do. I will use a few slides because there has been so many things happening during the last few months. We had uh, our fourth meeting of the conference of the parties in two segments, online in November last year and in person in March this year uh, in Bali with excellent hosting by the government of Indonesia. I would like to especially thank Carlos Manuel for your active participation in both segments and uh, you come to our COPs with no intention to thick the boxes but to really seek engagement and even though the convention and the JEP has had always excellent relationship, I think with you and your leadership, we can bring it to another level. And as also I mentioned to you several times, I'm learning a lot from you. In Bali, the parties took 12 decisions on a wide range of topics, uh, and the Indonesian presidency launched the Bali Declaration on Illegal Trade in Mercury. And also the convention is young, it proven already to be dynamic, COP decided to amend the convention with several new uh, listings of mercury added products for which manufacturing, import, and export is to be banned. And this includes, for example, wheel weights and even propellants for satellites and spacecraft, showing that our geographical scope extends very far. Our COP decisions on international cooperation reflect not only growing partnership within a family of chemicals conventions, but also for the first time recognize the importance of addressing mercury pollution in connection with the global loss of biodiversity. Putting this decision into action, we are already participating in the fourth meeting of the open-ended working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework taking place in Nairobi this week, Elizabeth has mentioned. As well as we speak, the, the parties there discuss whether and how to possibly amend one of the targets so that it explicitly mention chemicals, perhaps mercury too. On the fin and then further, parties adopted a framework for the effectiveness evaluation of the convention, established a new open-ended scientific group, and nicely advanced on some other technical and programmatic matters. On the financial mechanism, the discussions at the COP were smooth. Many parties expressed gratitude to Jeff for its continuing robust support to the implementation of the conventions, and the parties were showcasing the concrete work they did with the use of the Jeff funding. One observation made was that compliance-related challenges were mounting for developing countries as new deadlines are approaching, I'm therefore convinced that the Minamata Convention allocation GEF 8 will be entirely spent, as is the case in GEF 7. In addition, parties agreed on the terms of reference for the second review of the financial mechanism. The second review will be an important milestone in our relationship between Convention and GEF. And while I'm optimistic that the review will show the high value, efficiency, and effectiveness of the financial mechanism, I also look forward to its findings as they will allow parties to make any needed adjustments. Based on preparatory work led by the Secretariat, parties will conduct the review at COP5 next year. With this slide, I would like to show you some statistics on the high rate of the reporting by parties on the implementation of the convention. 
This national report, combined with the results of the review of the financial mechanism, will give parties a voice and a way to map their needs on a more detailed level as, as we progress with implementation of the Convention. On another note, while we are approaching conclusion on the work program of GEF 7, let me highlight to you some important activities funded by GEF. 117 Minamata initial assessments, MIAS as we call them, have been funded by GEF. The MIAS have provided a strong foundation to parties to zero in on the sectors of concern and for re relevant institutional frameworks to support control measures. And we have a very high quality national action plans for mercury use in the artisanal and small scale gold mining sector present over 70, in over 70 countries worldwide. The knowledge management component of the Jeff funded Planet Gold program has recently launched an excellent data visualization effort and this is just a snapshot of some of the interesting functionalities it provides. 46 NAPS projects have been funded by Jeff, and the blue countries depict 18 NAPS that have been submitted to the Secretariat today, and pink color depicts NAPS in progress. NAPS should include national reduction targets for mercury use in ASGM, snapshot of which is provided in a lower graph with yellow lines. The Convention's requirement for countries with more than insignificant ASGM to develop, submit, and implement NAPS is a key instrument to curb mercury emissions from this sector. It is therefore extremely important that the NAPS are developed, how they are developed, and what they contain, and naturally that they are implemented. Both Jeff and the Convention have mutual interest in getting project information like this one into the public domain in useful, user-friendly formats. And one other reason I wanted to show you the information on NAPS is that over time, as we progress with implementation and reporting, parties, secretariats, and agencies will have more granular information on impacts of actions and remaining needs for each stage of the Mercury life cycle. The JEF 7 portfolio has already moved well beyond enabling activities towards implementation and not just in ASGM sector but also in number of industrial sectors. And this is a trend I would like to encourage to become more established in JEF 8. And with this slide, I hope I will not regret that I'm using slides because this is such a packed slide. So I hope I will not use your attention. The idea is to give you a snapshot of the time-bound obligation our parties must implement. So I have pulled out a handful of them to illustrate the point that from coal combustion to cement production to chlorine production to PVC production, from thermometers to skin lightening products, and through entire life cycle of mercury, the Minamata Convention provides a clear and unambiguous way forward. It would not be an exaggeration to say that what parties and Jeff are doing is to make the convention obsolete in some 15, 20 years from now by implementing what can be captured in a single table. And as the last point, let me say we are pleased that Jeff 8 will advance integrated solutions to interrelated challenges while maintaining a strong focus on convention obligations the integrated program on hazardous chemicals in supply chains is quite promising in that it can move the gold, cement, and other supply chains to sustainability. But in addition, several of other IPs have direct linkages to the sectors covered by the convention. Through our ongoing collaboration with the Jeff Secretariat and Jeff agencies, we want to contribute to the design and rollout of the IPs and to this end, we would be happy to brief and engage with managers of other focal areas and the focal area staff in, agency, in the agencies. We are all gaining knowledge about one another's work, and I really believe that the more we can facilitate this, the better able we are to put in practice the great ideas on integration and co-benefits and amplify our messages, uh, uh, our party's needs, the urgency of action, and most of all, the opportunities to see nature, environment, and human health moving towards a brighter tomorrow. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Madam Executive uh, Secretary, for your presentation. And that's the last presentation. So before I open the floor for any comments uh, from the Council, I just want to, on, on your behalf, to place on record our appreciation to the four Executive Secretaries for uh, for sharing with the Council their perspectives on the Chef 8 replenishment and for bringing us to speed, up to speed in terms of uh, some of the outcomes of the conference of the parties and some of the key meetings that took place following our last uh, Council meeting in uh, December last year. I'm reminded that uh, we have one more speaker online. It's uh, from the UNCCD, so we will give the floor before we open for comments or questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and then uh, good afternoon and good evening to all the council members. And um, first, of course, to congratulate Carlos Manuel and to congratulate you all council members for the great achievements in, in this uh, replenishment of the GAF. I think that uh, this is giving a good message to the different parties. And basically what we are seeing, including in our UNCCD Cup, it's the need to really uh, works towards implementation of the different targets that we have. And uh, this is what we've been hearing, but I will be try to be very brief. Um, before the COP, our 15th COP in Abidjan, we launched the Global Land Outlook. It was um, our approach to try to generate momentum, bring in some specific data to the table and to the different stakeholders. And with this GLO2, we managed to see that up to 40% of the planet's land is degraded, directly affecting half of humanity and threatening nearly half of global GDP. And I think that with these specific numbers, we managed to start bringing a lot of the political attention and the momentum that we felt in Abidjan in the COP. During the COP, a very successful COP, more than 7,000 participants were there attending the COP. We managed to have a high level of political segment with the presidential summit included, and also with the participation of more than 54 ministers uh, participating and discussing different issues related to uh, land degradation and drought. Um, we also had the engagement of different stakeholders, a very successful Green Business Forum, uh, Youth Engagement uh, Forum, also requesting support for a Youth Engagement Strategy, a gender caucus, and again, we launched a report around with the relation and the differentiated impacts of, of land degradation, uh, and the differentiated impacts for women and men. And again, the numbers are very clear and the importance of every uh, intervention that we will be doing around land restoration about addressing land degradation and drought should have a very clear gender component. It was the first time that we had a food day in a, for the first time in a Rio convention and the other uh, interesting aspect that I would like to highlight in general terms is that we also had one decision adopted that included the concept of nature-based solutions that, as you know, it has always been there as all, also as an element that was there. And I think that it is important just to highlight that, that aspect. But um, in terms of some of the specific decisions and, and talking, I, I think that we've been hearing this integration and synergies between all the conventions. And I think that this was the spirit that was there in Abidjan in the COP. And um, there was a clear acknowledgement from the different parties that the SDGs target 15.3 has created a strong momentum for the implementation of, the, of this convention. But 
I will say that the process of setting the voluntary land degradation utility target, the parties, uh, they feel it that they support the synergies approach of the three conventions. Um, and I will be brief in some of the most, um, I will say important decisions that arise during the COP. Decision 12, for example, uh, welcomed the support provided by the Secretary of the Global Mechanism and the relevant partners to effectively assist countries in this process of setting the land degradation neutrality process and the implementation efforts. But the COP at the same time requested the Secretary of the GM and relevant partners as Jeff in some of areas that I think that are of interest for, for all of us developing necessary tools to translate the voluntary land degradation neutrality targets into concrete actions, increasing efficiency in deployment, existing financial resources, building greater synergy with relevant processes, and promoting development of large scale national, multi-country and sub-region and sub -regional transformative projects and programs. And here again, we were hearing about uh, other big initiatives in different areas, uh, such as the Central American Dry Corridor in other areas in Asia. So I think that there was generating a big momentum and bringing the importance of having this land degradation neutrality process as a transformative approach that could also uh, foster synergies on the land in the implementation process. The other element um, that the parties bring, and it, what this was on decision 12, they highlighted the pivotal role of the land degradation neutrality fund that as you know, it's the private fund uh, that it is supported by Mirava. And they were saying that this could be a replicable model of collaboration between public and private sector. And they also requested uh, to the DM and other partners to provide technical pre-investment support to country project developers. And again, uh, the parties were saying that, yes, we understand that there are different funds there. Land degradation neutrality is one of the funds, but they need support to articulate and formulate good projects. And the other element in decision 13 is that, that they requested um, a methodology and to conduct a need assessment to determine the financial requirements for the implementation of the convention. And I think that these uh, decisions are very critical, very related to the work that the, G, that the GAF is discussing and doing. In terms of drought, as you know, uh, the different countries were bringing the need to uh, elevate the importance and the support to generate resilience for drought. And we had the decision 23 to establish a new intergovernmental working group on drought with uh, the task of identifying and evaluating options, policy instruments, regional policy frameworks, and also understanding the drought national plans to really generate resilience, manage drought, and supporting a shift from reactive to proactive drug management. So there was, I think, one of the elements that was there. There were other important COP decisions also related, for example, to sun and dust storms. But I will say these are some of the key highlights. And just to, to close my remarks, uh, we welcome the replenishment approved by Jeff Aid and also the increased flexibility for countries to allocate their start um, allocation across focal areas to define projects that address their priorities. We really see that land-based approach can generate multiple benefits that facilitate this systemic approach with win-win opportunities for climate biodiversity and land degradation um, and that we have the possibility of continuing supporting countries. As you know, we have right now more than 107 countries that have served their LDN targets and that we really need to mobilize that also to try to promote the implementation part. 
but also, and, and I think that I heard it in one of the presentations before, the importance of really integrating some of these land use planning uh, policies that we see could be very transformative and could have very important impacts for climate, for, for mitigation, for adaptation, and to guarantee and save biodiversity. Um, just to close, I know that Patricia Espinosa is not there, but I think that we really would like to thank her for all the work that she's doing uh, and that she has done there leading the, the convention. And, um, and thank you all for your attention. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Andrea Mesa, Deputy Executive Secretary of uh, UNCCD, for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation. I now open the floor for any comments or questions, conscious of the fact that we are already almost uh, half an hour late in our program. That's not meant to discourage you in asking questions, but uh, just to caution in terms of uh, we have uh, limited time uh, on our hand at the moment, but uh, the floor is open. Tom, you have the floor. Ambassador Fetturi, uh, it is so important to, uh, let us say, intervene and say thank you so much to all of the executive secretaries for your uh, presentations because uh, it is very important. Uh, for our work, and uh, we're glad that the Jeff family is responsive to your instructions. And I'm also glad that uh, the UNCCD had an opportunity to put on the table drought. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for heeding my suggestion. I give the floor to Canada or to France. Clemens, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Co-président. Nous souhaiterions remercier le secrétariat pour ce rapport et son implication continue auprès des différentes conventions que le FEM soutient. Nous tenons à souligner l'importance pour le FEM en tant qu'institution de ne jamais cesser de faire connaître ses activités et de se rendre accessible lors des conférences des partis ou des réunions des organes subsidiaires des conventions. Connaissant bien le FEM, nous pourrions penser qu'il en est de même pour tout le monde. Ce n'est pas le cas. Chaque COP, chaque intercession euh, doit être l'occasion pour le FEM, en lien le cas échéant avec d'autres fonds multilatéraux, de, se faire co de faire connaître ses activités en soutien des objectifs des conventions et de faire connaître le FEM et ses activités auprès des personnes qui négocient au nom de leur pays ou groupe. À cet égard, nous saluons le fait que le FEM participe à distance et sur place aux réunions du groupe de travail à composition non limitée qui se tient cette semaine à Nairobi pour la préparation du futur cadre mondial pour la biodiversité. Nous encourageons le PDG du FEM à porter une, une attention particulière aux discussions qui se tiennent dans ce cadre. Nous remercions également le secrétariat pour le suivi qui a été fait des négociations dans le cadre de la conférence intergouvernementale sur un instrument international juridiquement contraignant dans le cadre de la Convention des Nations Unies sur le droit de la mer concernant la conservation et l'utilisation durable de la diversité biologique marine des zones situées au-delà des juridictions nationales. Nous reconnaissons avec appréciation l'expérience significative du FEM sur la thématique des eaux internationales. Nous comprenons que les négociations du traité BBNJ pourraient aboutir cet été. Nous nous interrogeons sur les prochaines étapes dans le cas où un rôle spécifique du FEM dans l'accord était décidé. Nous souhaitons enfin souligner l'importance des enjeux liés à la mise en œuvre de l'amendement de Kigali au protocole de Montréal, en particulier concernant l'efficacité énergétique. Nous encourageons le secrétariat du FEM à suivre et participer aux échanges sur cette thématique menée dans le contexte du comité exécutif du Fonds multilatéral et des réunions des partis au protocole de Montréal. Je vous remercie. Thank you, uh, Clemens. Uh, I give the floor to Yoshiko of Japan to be followed by Renato of uh, Brazil. 
Thank you very much for giving me the floor. We thank the Secretariat for working with the conventions throughout, even throughout the pandemic. In view of the aborted process, uh, we think that it's very important for the GEF to adapt as necessary the programming to be in conformity with subsequent convention COP decisions. This is particularly important for biodiversity focal area, which will not only have, have uh, which will not have finished negotiating the next long-term global biodiversity framework and plans to adopt it in December of this year. In that context, we note with interest how the Secretary plans to operationalize paragraph 16 on page 3 to enable uh, early actions to implement the GBF to review and align their national targets uh, and MBSAP's policy frameworks, et cetera, because every single goal and target of the GBF to date are exhibiting wide levels of disagreement until, of course, they resolve it this week. So we hope that early disbursements impl or implementation will not lead to risk of inefficient double work from any efforts of front-running the adoption of the GBF. My second comment relates to a related but separate INF document on progress report on the UNFCCC capacity building initiative for transparency, which is linked to this agenda item. With regard to Pair 9 on in ensuring BTRs under the UNFCCC, we note that we're currently in the transitioning period from the UNFCCC reporting to the Paris Agreement reporting, so we therefore request the Secretariat to avoid duplication of support on the two reporting methods given in the same country. We also point out that in paragraph 36 of the report that there is no agreed definition of what comprises a reporting system and that further discussions will be required on this issue. So we'd like to request the Secretariat to provide appropriate support in flexible and timely manner and most importantly in line with the most recent discussions and decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshiko. I give the floor to Renato of Brazil to be followed by Silvia of Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, um, and then I thank the, all the, the presentation made, uh, which was very rich and, and informative. Our, um, our constituency uh, welcome also the report and the, the efforts performed by Jeff in its relationship to other convention institutions. In this regard, I'd like to commend the efforts, uh, to commend the joint efforts between Jeff and GCF secretariats on the oper operationalization of the long-term vision to achieve complementary coherence and collaboration. Uh, as it is the case of many organizations with similar and shared mandates, it is important to continue to work to avoid project overlap and duplication of work. In this regard, we believe um, that the, um, the, the two institutions could partner to replicate good practices and complement each other. There are numerous areas and programs that the two institutions could explore such so as the Red Plus uh, pilot program in GCF, or enhancing GF's capacity to aid developing countries to provide their reports to UNFCCC and Paris agreements through the CBIT. In the same way, I would like to ask for clarification on this stage of the pilot coordinate engagement on project regarding um, the Amazon Sustainable Landscape IP program. I know that this program was, was a, one of the, uh, the pilot projects under the coordinate engagement. So we know that the pilot program has been kick-started with, uh, uh, with Ecuador, but so far we have no knowledge on how it has developed, especially the relationship with its stakeholders and Jeff efforts to secure alignment with GCF in interventions, particularly for Jeff 7 and uh, the, the, the Amazon Sustainable Landscape Phase 2, which has uh, seven countries from the Amazon region. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. I give the floor to Sylvia of Germany to be followed by Rob of the United States of America. Thank you, co-chair. Germany welcomes the report by all the convention. We particularly welcome the GEF's effort to promote synergies between the various conventions. Exploring these synergies and establishing cooperation is an ever more urgent uh, factor as we face the triple crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. It is indispensable to closely look at the interlinkages between sustainability challenges. Germany appreciates the collaboration between the GEF and the Adaptation Fund, especially with regards to the, the exchange on gender. Learning from best practices, how to center action and how to approach gender mainstreaming and adaptation relevant interventions are of great importance. Germany encourages the Jeff Secretariat to further intensify the interaction with the Adaptation Fund and other funds such as the GCF and the CIFs. 
Germany sees the intensified collaboration between the GEF and the GCS as vital. After the establishment of the Stirring Committee and its first meeting, Germany is looking forward to the publication of the long-term vision work plan for its implementation. For the upcoming Steering Committee meeting, Germany would like to propose the following topics for discussion and consideration. A harmonization of application, monitoring and reporting processes across funds, joint trainings, synergetic use of funds by piloting and upscaling innovative projects, enhancing private sector mobilization through an active strategic exchange, medium term um, the introduction of a standardized process across funds to reach medium-term goals. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Germany, for that intervention. I know I did mention that uh, Rob of the United States of America was going to speak after that. I've been, re uh, been suggested that uh, if we can, uh, there are, I think, more than eight uh, other speakers who want to take the floor. At the moment, we also have another prior engagement that uh, and uh, the president has been uh, waiting for more than half an hour. So the suggestion of the of the co-chair is that uh, we break for, for 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 lunch for that particular briefing, and then when we come back, we will continue with the questions, and then uh, hopefully we will we'll also be able to ask the executive secretaries for responses. So that is a suggestion, and uh, I want to make, make that suggestion now that we break for, for lunch and then come back in, uh, in an hour's time. Yeah, and then we can continue. Uh, and on my list as of now, we have the United States of America, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, CSO Network, UK, and I'm sure the list will continue. Yeah. yeah. And Gustavo has a uh, comment. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as you know, in the program, we now have uh, what we are calling an informal lunch uh, on the BBNJ process that's uh, undergoing, in which the Jeff has uh, been identified uh, as having a possible role. And we'll have the session uh, that we will initiate uh, with the president of the IGC, the Intergovernmental Committee uh, on the BBNJ under the UN Law of the Sea. And she's in Singapore at the moment, it's getting late. So uh, what we propose you do is you go outside, uh, grab a plate, uh, if you wanna be participating in this dialogue, and come back here, we're gonna have a lunch and the program will follow uh, as we have planned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Uh, so lunch will be served again, uh, buffet style in the foyer, so you're welcome to come back, and then we will restart the session at uh, 2 p.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>